Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. At The Reason We Learn, we aspire to be part of the solution. The purpose of this show is to take a good, honest, potentially painful look at the way kids are being educated. We know we can do better, and this is where we'll talk about how. Let's learn something. Hello. <laughs> Sorry for the slightly late start. It's a Saturday. You can forgive me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. Today, we have another study says, or did it, you know, or does it. <laughs> I show feel like that with, could be a video series at this point or just well, a I recurring put, show a or something playlist. like that. <laughs> I made a playlist for our, our three shows together where that's pretty much what the playlist is called. It's like study says or does it? <laughs> <laughs> because, and you know, one of these days, it's kind of like Kieran's show with me where it's like, is it true? Is that true? Is this going to be like our science version of of that? So, oh, hi, Ego Brain. Hi, Jeff. Good to see you, Ego Brain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... We've got a good one today. Um, Depends on your definition of good, but. <laughs> it, uh, how about a classic example of the kind of game that gets played with the American public when it comes to education and, you know, what research shows or what is evidence based education, everybody? So let me, let me, let me, let me set it up for you. Let me set it up for you. Okay. So on this channel, I've talked a lot about critical race theory, I've talked a lot about kids subjected to lessons that are critical pedagogy, et cetera. And one of the, one of the arguments that I've made and many of us have made is that amongst other things, amongst the fact that it's communist, you know, um, critical pedagogy creates winners and losers and oppressed and, you know, oppressors and so forth. And among other reasons that's wrong to do, right, is that it kind of divides students against each other and it gives them a sense of a sense of self that is not aligned with reality necessarily and can possibly stress them out. But it's not like that's our number one or even in our top five of arguments. Let, let me just lay that out there. I, any, any, sunk premise that says the reason you people don't like us teaching anti-racism in the school as you think it stresses out you poor fragile white people but that's been what people have said is it's white tears it's white fragility these parents don't want their precious white babies to have to be subjected to any bad news about white people well that's bogus it has nothing to do with that we think generally speaking that putting kids into a situation where you don't allow them to think you present them with information that's very zero sum. Um, you know, can be stressful, but it can also just make them angry, or it could make them apathetic, or it make them it can make them feel a range of emotions that have nothing to do with the kind of discomfort that goes along with good learning. I mean, there there is discomfort with learning new information. Yeah, and you know, it can be good discomfort. It can be challenge, but what we're saying is the challenge shouldn't derive from falsehoods or a political agenda, right? Exactly, that gets yeah. misinterpreted to, oh, you don't want your kids to be stressed. You want them to be, you know, babied and coddled. No, that nobody said that. Like literally nobody said that. But leading with that, we, we found uh, an article, NC State University right here in, well, actually it's technically both our home states, <laughs> depending how far back you go. Um, well, yes. Pub and I guess, I guess for the interest of full disclosure, NC State is actually my alma mater, um, myself. So <laughs> there you go. So on the, amongst the many reasons I asked Adrian to come and help analyze this. So this is what we found. No, an anti-racist program in schools didn't stress out kids. <laughs> I'm going to call attention to a couple of things. Notice it says an anti-racist program didn't stress out kids. It says in schools. Well, it was one school, really. So there's that. Um, now, whether or not they've used this same program in other schools, I suspect they have. But the research was confined to one school. So let's be very clear on that. They say schools, plural. It was one program, one school. Um, I'm going to just read through some of this and call some things to your attention. I want to call to your attention some words because everything about this study relies on definitions of words like stress like um belonging you know, is another one actually belonging 
um, even things like research. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, well, well, let's go through this. It says a new study of how high school students respond to a program designed to increase the frequency and quality of conversations about race in school finds that the anti-racist intervention did not cause stress or feelings of alienation among study participants. The finding rebuts concerns, the ones I just told you that we allegedly have but don't, that anti-racist programs are harmful to children and teens. Now, again, we allege they're harmful to children and teens, but not because they cause stress, because they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they probably do cause a little stress, but they're wrong. They're incorrect and they're biased. But let me let me parse this ever so slightly. It says the program is designed to increase frequency and quality of conversation. So Adrian's going to talk to us when we go through the study about whether that was, in fact, what the program was designed to do. OK, I have my own theories on that when I looked at the program, but then we also have to look at the research about the program. So did it evaluate that? Did it evaluate whether they had m more high quality conversations about race. And then they call that an anti-racist program. So anti-racist program equals program that gets people talking about race more often and at a higher quality level. So definition of quality is important. And the definition, as I said before, of things like stress are important. Even the definition of conversation at this point is up for grabs. The study could serve as a blueprint for assessing anti-racist intervention. So Adrian will tell us if it really could. Young, <laughs> young people are aware of racial injustice and related social issues. But you'll notice in this article, no, no proof for that statement is given. Nothing is. Uh, they don't tell us how they know that. My first question was, how, how, how do you know that? Young people are aware of racial injustice and related social issues. And schools are interested in helping students understand racial justice. So they've already sunk the premise that there's such a thing called racial justice right in there and that our kids want to know all about it and how to achieve it, right? And they've defi they're defining social issues and what our kids are aware of. They don't tell us how they define any of these words. Lots of words, no definitions. Then it says, and develop the tools they need to discuss these issues in a meaningful way. I'm so curious what a meaningful way looks like. Hmm. Says Kelly Lynn Mul Mulvey, co-author of a paper on the work and associate professor of psychology at NC State. So to review real quickly, social issues and racial injustice, we don't know what those mean. We don't know how they know that kids know about it. And we don't know what discussing it in a meaningful way would look like to these people or the students for that matter. There are multiple programs that aim to help schools accomplish these goals. Oh, I'm so curious. What are they? Mulvey said, in this study, we wanted to determine how effective one such program was. Now, here's another thing. It says, in the study, we wanted to determine how effective one such program is. Now, remember what we said the goal was to define effectiveness? That they would have more frequent, high-quality conversations about race. Now, I will say, as it's listed in the news release, because this is a news release from That's NC State. Right. That's what we're telling you all this, that this is the reporting on the study. So we'll show you how that like is, is or is <laughs> not uh, represented in the study. Did it help students understand racial justice issues? So that seems like a second goal, doesn't it, Adrian? First, it's like, was it effective getting them talking about them in a high quality way? But now they seem to be hinting at what high quality is. Did they understand racial justice issues? Understand. What's the definition of understand, do you think? What would, how would we measure their understanding of racial justice issues? Did it make them more comfortable talking about these issues? That's another thing they would have to measure. And were there any unintended effects on the students? Another thing you'd have to measure. So by my count, we're measuring like five things. We're, we're measuring like five things in the study. That's a lot. That's a lot of heavy lifting that one study has to do. For the study, researchers from MCC, blah, blah, other schools were in on it, but they were the, Adrian tells me they're basically the, the chief, you know, head writers of it. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the first author is from NC State. So that's why the press release is from NC State. So that, that, that's the thing there. Because Mulvaney herself was not the first author. She was the last author. But there's, a, there's another person who is the first author who is from NC State. So that's, that's cool. just some side notes there. Okay. All right.
So uh, let's see. This is what they worked in partnership with a public high school to assess the impact of a classroom intervention aimed at helping students understand and discuss issues related to racism. Again, they're telling us it was aimed at helping students understand and discuss issues related to racism. The intervention was conducted for 45 minutes once a week. So once a week, one classroom, one school for 10 weeks. So that's 10 times they met. Specifically, the researchers did an assessment of 227 students before the intervention and three months after the intervention. But Adrian's going to talk to us about how many students were originally in the program and how it was 227 at the end. But we don't talk about that. Anyway, um, aimed at capturing how engaged students were. So we need a definition for engaged. So look for it when we get to that. How students related with staff, they have to measure that, the extent to which they felt they belonged to the school community. That's an item number six now that we're measuring. There's a lot of stuff they were after measuring, yeah. So <laughs> that's six, no, and relating to the staff, that's seven things. Oh, yeah. That is seven variables that we are oh, well, measuring. Oh, well, and keep going, and keep going, because oh, there's more oh, on that keep line. keep going. Yes, <laughs> there's more. Student stress, that's eight. And the extent to which students perceive social inequality, that's nine. This is amazing study. They're measuring nine things so far. In addition, in addition. So this, I love how they go in addition. In addi We're measuring nine things. And then in addition of our 227, 67, a sampling of the study participants also completed daily surveys. Remember, they're in the class one day a week for 10 weeks, but they're doing daily surveys for three weeks of the 10 during the intervention. Were they the first three weeks, last three weeks, random three weeks? Do we know? Did they tell us in the survey? No, the, in, the, in the supplemental of the article, they actually have a calendar for when the daily things were and when the intervention days actually were. There was one week sort of at the beginning where they had the daily diaries. There was one week in the middle and there was one week at the end. They okay, didn't so do it all the way through. So they're kind of like spacing them out. Okay, I think that's relevant to know. All right, um, let's see what else. These surveys were designed to capture daily fluctuations in each student's stress levels and feelings of belonging. I can't say that word without, you know, a little bit. <laughs> One, I, I can't, it's belonging. Is no, bullshit. I can't do it either. I mean, I, I've read it so many times. I'm kind of like, whatever anymore, because it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything, especially when you like how many of these things, these nine or 10 things that we're talking about now we have 10 belonging. So how, <laughs> how many of these are purely subjective? How do we measure these things objectively? Like, how do we know? Oh yes, definitively they felt belonging and they weren't just reporting it. And we know that they felt it. We know. One of the key findings was that 60% of study participants reported being highly engaged with the intervention and another 20% were passively yeah. somewhat engaged. We're going to come back to that. <laughs> yeah. Make a mental note of 60% were highly <laughs> engaged. And everyone knows, right, guys, that when you ask students how engaged they are in some material that you're giving them, they're, they're going to report, you know, yeah, I read the book. Uh-huh. Uh yeah, I read the book. You see me once a week for 10 weeks. I, for sure. Are you enjoying the time? Uh-huh. You know, like, okay. Anyway, I'd love to know the racial breakdown of the 60%. I think uh, that's, that's relevant. I think that's in there, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd be really interested to know how many felt compelled to say, oh, yes, I'm highly engaged in this material. <laughs> anyway, um, then it says students in our study were actively interested in learning about and discussing issues related to racism, says Mulvey, and the highly engaged group demonstrated significant growth in their awareness of social inequality after the intervention. I love the use of the word growth because <laughs> it's just not really appropriate here. It's like they we, we they they had high degrees of agreement with us by the end, by the, end of the, stu the study. Um cuz what is growth? Awareness of social inequality. Yep. Are you allowed to challenge whether there is a lot of a racial inequality right now? No, of course not. Your growth is measured by whether you agree that there is. Yay! Okay. A lot of the opposition to addressing racism in schools hinges on the idea that the anti-racist programming is somehow harmful or stressful. No, it doesn't. It certainly does not hinge on that idea. That's just extra. <laughs> Our study finds that at least with this program in this school, at least they qualified say at least with this program and in this school. Did you get that from the headline though? 
Yeah, I mean, you could say N A N anti because you're saying N anti racist program in schools. You don't get that from the headlines. So this is no. a point to keep in mind, and I'm sure I'm sure Kieran would have things to say about how this press release was written. But yeah, I mean, they tried to be honest when they said N anti racist program, but they said in schools plural. Yeah. Very, very misleading. Well, and I will tell you, let me let me make a point on that because even the authors in the very end of their own article go on to say, well, because of X thing and this thing and this thing over here, we can't really generalize this to other schools. We can't even generalize this to the rest of this school where we did the analysis. They said both of those things. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. So it's nice of them to toss in buried down at the end where almost no one is going to read, you know, at least in this school, <laughs> maybe a little bit. All right. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it says, I mean, so many misstatements. Look at the hinges on the idea. No, it isn't. Um, what's more, there's no evidence that the intervention is stressful or has an adverse impact on students' feelings of belonging in their school community. You know, I got to be honest with you. I don't give a rat's ass if my child feels a sense of belonging in the school if you're teaching her the truth yeah. okay like if you're te if you're teaching factual information but she just isn't making a lot of friends and kind of is happy to come home at the end of the day and doesn't really feel like school as much of anything except where she goes to learn facts and information and learn how to think and challenge herself and develop skills i'm okay with that i'm cool with that that is not why i'm going to challenge your stupid program i'm challenging your program because it's bullshit it's full of lies. So if they think, don't worry, your student will feel like they belong. Um, sure, if you give them a way to absolve themselves of their horrible guilt, then of course they have a way to belong. You've given them one in your little church of whatever it is. Um, now let's see, based on what we learned here in our interactions with the educators, the school, the study also underscores the value of partnerships with educators in the research community. Yeah, that that um that author you've quoted there, Serta Smith, she's the lead author. Okay. Um, and then of course they said it is particularly valuable for teachers. Another exciting component of the study is that we were able to capture student experience in a variety of ways. Well, Adrian, tell us as a scientist, is capturing student experience in a variety of ways a valuable thing if the data that you collect is not reliable? Does it matter how many different ways you collected it? Um, it doesn't matter how many different ways you collect it if it's not reliable, but it also, I wouldn't agree with the assessment assertion she's made that we captured students' appearance experiences in a variety of ways. Because I mean, just a spoiler alert on that, they're relying entirely on survey of results of the students. And then the variety of ways is essentially a number of different modeling, modeling things. It's not, okay. it's not actually, you know, let's say you could actually do like a mental health assessment of the students or what have you, instead of relying on them to actually, you know, provide their levels of perceived stress in a in a questionnaire or something like that, that would actually be looking at it in a variety of ways. And I would argue the latter thing of like, you know, professional psychological assessment or something like that would actually be more valuable than the survey questions. But well, that's a whole, whole other thing. The whole thing too, we get down to, you know, they say this approach could serve as a model for future work aimed at broadening our understanding of anti-racist. Even they and said it themselves in their own article that you cannot generalize the results. You well, cannot generalize everything. And, and, and also important, I think, is the fact that all of this presupposes that doing so-called anti-racist work is necessary in the first place. Like the, they are putting this on par with teaching kids to read. So when, you know, understand that from an, educator standpoint, when you come in and say, we need to find the right approach to do this kind of teaching, you're presupposing that this subject matter is essential when that has not yet been established. They have not established like reading, writing, arithmetic, history, et cetera, et cetera, that anti-racist intervention is either necessary or beneficial to anyone. Never mind which program works well or doesn't work. If you're working, if you want to find what works well to do something you don't want to do, it's kind of irrelevant, isn't it? Why are mm -hmm. we spending research time, dollars, and student time, student learning time, even once a week for 10 weeks to do something that I can assure you a lot of parents are out there going, hey, can you just make sure my kid can freaking read before you decide to do this obviously politicized garbage? Yep. And then I think the title of the paper is interesting, a novel approach for evaluating a school-wide yep. anti-racist curriculum intervention. So, and all, all assuming 
that having one is is a given. And now we need a novel way to evaluate whether it works at whatever we decided it needs to do. There's so much wrong with this. And they go, it hinges on my concern about people being stressed. No, no. Oh, God. Like I said, I, you know what? It's not even in the top 10. Whether yep. the students are stressed out taking this class is not even in my top 10 of reasons why I hate this. So having said all that, real quick, you know, see how it says American Education Research Association, just showing you quickly who they are. Um, they were founded in 1916. They're concerned with improving the educational process by encouraging scholarly inquiry related to education and evaluation and by promoting the dissemination and practical application of research yep. results. So nothing on the top that is like yep. particularly- I mean, as, as an agency off the top, they're, as an association rather off the top, they're a professional, professional society of education researchers. They're not a professional society of teachers or anything like that. No, but also understand that if you go back to 1916 in that time period, you're right smack dab in the progressive era. You're right smack dab in the era when, you know, Dewey and Horace Mann and all of them said that it's absolutely essential that we establish an education institution. Remember that didn't exist. So in other words, for thousands of years, we've been teaching young people how to live on planet earth, not always in like a school, but people have it tutors, small lyceum, you know, school situations, whatever. And even in formal schools for a very, very long time before this. And there was no such thing as education research. There was no such thing as educators. There were teachers, tutors, uh, you know, things like that. And, and so Dewey and them said, we have to have this. And part of the reason why they wanted this whole research was they wanted to find out what are the absolute best scientific ways to get the kids to think the way we want them to think and do the things we want them to do. They changed from a knowledge kind of oriented way of teaching people, which has been done for thousands of years, learn these things and then learn how to think about them and apply them to uh, how do you feel about it? Like, let's talk about how we feel about things and how we feel about the world, whatever. And how we do that is we constantly research how, the, what's going on with this. So there, there's nothing like nefarious about them other than in my personal opinion, they never should have existed in the first place because I'm a classicist. Um, but <laughs> no, I mean, Full disclosure, I am. I think that the way they did it in the ancient times was perfectly adequate and works very democratically across all different socioeconomic uh, groups, et cetera. Yeah. Facts are facts, knowledge is knowledge, brains are brains. You don't you, you don't need special ways of teaching people because they're brown. Um, but any, but this says that you do. So now moving on to the actual study, this this is where uh, this is where we get to. Adrian's domain. And now I'm going to stop talking for a little while. <laughs> so, I mean, this is an interesting, it was a very interesting study for me to read. And off the top, I will say, you know, they do go in immediately with the assumptions that, and you, you probably saw it yourself when you're reading it, Deb, all the references to Paulo Freire and um, the whole collection of things in there. And so, they come off with it off the top that instilling critical consciousness in kids is good. Okay. And actually it is later on in the article that they present the same argument, the same straw man argument that you're talking about. Well, it just stresses out white kids. That's why people don't want it. And they point to somebody else who said the same thing. Well, this is why parents really don't want it is because they're stressed out. You know, they're claiming the kids are stressed out. But it's actually more so the argument that you and I have been talking about that, well, you really haven't shown that critical consciousness is actually a good thing to develop in kids and can be very easily argued because one of the things that struck me with this is that this article in its presentation uh, flies in the face of a lot of, yeah, like there's things like that <laughs> that show up all the time. Um there's a lot of things with this article that flies in this in the face of previous literature that talks about how DEI trainings and such things didn't work and actually had some very harmful consequences. There's actually serious literature that goes into that with regards to things after the fact. Like, for example, Musa Algarbi did a really great um, review of the literature for Real Clerk Science in 2020. One of the things he found in the literature was, well, okay, one of the things that apparently the DEI trainings did was it ended up creating this false stereotype in a lot of people that folks in my other group are really fragile and sensitive, so I can't talk with them, but it made them, because they didn't want to offend somebody and they were afraid of doing it, less likely to work with them. So congratulations, 
in the name of fostering diversity, you failed in fostering diversity. <laughs> you know, you scared people away. Things like that. A lot of unintended consequences or maybe intended consequences. I really don't know at this point. Um, but I'll give the benefit of the doubt with that. Unintended consequences of folks, some of the folks who probably mean well implementing certain things, but then otherwise there are other folks who don't, definitely don't. But this article is premised on the idea that um, critical consciousness is a good thing to instill in students. Yeah. To develop a awareness in history. Now, what was it from the news release that they were saying they wanted to measure whether or not the frequency of conversations was good, right? Frequency and quality. Frequency of and quality conversations. of conversations got better after Not a after peep this about awareness. Yeah. They, in fact, they led with students are aware. Right. Stu they led with like the students are interested. The students are right. aware. The student, exactly. like the Frarian no no idea that we're doing this because students want it. Students need it. And then they come in and say the goal was to develop awareness. Yeah, exactly. So which is it? <laughs> so yeah, they, they really muddled it in there. And I will say right away, because I, I did go looking for that um, with respect to the, you know, did they actually measure frequency and quality of conversations? And I can guarantee you this article never measured that. That was actually never, ever measured anywhere in any of the survey results or anything like that. They didn't measure the reading comprehension. They didn't measure have anything like they did talk about three months post-intervention. Well, what were the students talking about three months post-intervention? Were they having quality conversations with their peers? How do you measure that? Never was that measured in this study. So that's a false statement in the news release to begin with, because they never actually measured that. <laughs> so it's a point to pay there, which is which is sad and, to me. And, that and I think thing. this is really important. Yes. So uh, let me, where's the number? Let me get the number so I have it in front of me. Um, yes. But... So they mentioned that 227 students in the final sample. So they did an analysis of attrition that ended up in, so little backstory for those of you who don't read journal articles as much as I do, oftentimes because there are word limits to the actual journal articles, things that are important that can't end up in the main text end up in what's called supplemental material or supporting information. Those have to be linked off of this page and you can find this linked off of this page. And for those of you listening, I encourage you to go have fun reading this because this is an open access article. It's not behind a paywall. So you can go grab everything we're showing you and go look at it yourself. So, you know, I encourage that. But so let's see. Um, do, 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 do. Here's what they said about the sample itself from the supplementary material I'm reading off on my other side of the screen. Um, a total of 584 students or 668.8% uh, of the enrolled students in that school in September 2020 assented to, to participate. They have a typo in the supplemental. This is fun. I just realized there's a typo. Um, <laughs> because it oh says God. assented, it said, um, it says assented to participant instead of assented to participate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, in at least one of the pre or post intervention surveys, given that the stamped participation items only appear on the post intervention survey and are need to control for student experiences at pre intervention, our final sample included only students who responded to both surveys. Thus, we excluded 325 students because they only completed one survey. An additional 32 participants were excluded because they did not respond to any of the stamped engagement items. Therefore, the final sample of included 227 students. Of students included in the final sample, 67 were included in the daily check in subset, uh, subsample. So those are the students that did the actual daily diary. So when we can do some quick math here, let's just round things up. So 584 is 70% of the students in that school, effectively. And then you drop it to less than half of that, 230. <laughs> Right. It's not 70% of the school anymore. It goes to maybe 20 or 30% if you're lucky. <laughs> well, point. and and we have no way of knowing why it dropped so far. They're claiming it's COVID because of full virtual schooling. Yeah. But that, that it, is the other point to keep in mind, because this was conducted, the, the actual research itself was conducted. This paper is 2024. It was just published. But it was, the research itself was actually conducted in 2020, the fall of 2020, specifically when everybody was online. Right. And so it's just kind of weird because it's not, you know, like it, that that many people checked out doesn't to me 
show that what they they claimed in the news release about students want to know this and students are very you know interested in this you know to go then jump to 60 percent of the students that were the 30 percent of the school that remained or whatever it was exactly so if you're they, talking you know, about what are you talking about you're talking about the engaged the active students in there of that 30 so maybe it's like 10 15 percent of the students maybe 20 percent right. tops at the school right. were actively engaged right, right. Exactly. And I just find that very interesting. I also can't get over how much effort they put into talking about critical consciousness in the paper yep. that they conveniently left out of the news release. Yep. And, re and remember, the news release was just written. And this has been worked on for the last four years, right? I mean, I didn't just start writing the research paper. Yep. The research pa They did the research in 2020. And they've you know been writing it and writing it, and this was what they wanted to do. Now, do you think, given everything we now know and all of the political stuff that's come out about CRT and so on, and all the flap that maybe even NC State has gotten over it, that they wanted to really mention the stuff about the critical cut? I would imagine they didn't want to. I would imagine that yeah. NC State wouldn't have wanted to. Um, we're never going to know the answer to that for sure, or what they were thinking. Just when a they guess. Put out the news I just release, threw that but... out. Yeah, just threw no. that out. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, they, they do spend a lot in here talking about it. And I think in that section, because the, where they're talking about critical reflection and critical motivation, you know, the whole thing there, like they never measure, like I said, they never measure the frequency and quality of the conversations afterwards ever. There's never that measurement done. Um, really they might be like, they have the staff student relationships thing is in right. there. Yes. Mm -hmm. They have the stress thing is in there. Yes. They have some strange measure of belonging. Yes. They <laughs> so Adrian, are you telling us that the news article is lying? No, it's wrong. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, I hesitate, right. I hesitate to say lying. And the reason I hesitate to say that is because you don't know who was writing and you don't know exactly True. how much, well, there's a, there's a byline for the guy who wrote the press release. Yes. But you don't know how much of it the guy wrote on his own and then just sent it to them and said, yeah. And they just said, yeah, it looks good. Um, and the same thing with the interviews, you know, how much of an interview did they cut and what portions did they use of the interview and the text in there? And what did they not? And things like that. So sure. I hesitate to say lying just because you don't it's know. Certainly it may have been, it's certainly misleading. It's misleading. Yeah. In the end, whether it was intended to be or not, it is misleading to say that the study was designed to measure these things. And then you turn around and a study that was done four years before you wrote your news piece yep. doesn't measure that at all. Yeah. Now, I mean, admittedly, what may be happening is because, of course, these these are still active professors, right? So they could be working on something else at the same time. And they're just thinking about the other thing, you know, the other thing that they're working on that might be related. To frequency. I'm being charitable and giving the benefit of the doubt with this, but you never know. Um, and that kind of thing. So there's things like that. But yeah, in this specific study, they never did. They never measured the frequency and quality of conversation. And and this right here, I just want to be clear for the audience. This actually is the number one reason most of us yeah. don't like, you know, you want to know yeah. why we criticize anti-racist teaching in school. It hinges on this part, you know, this part, the critical pedagogy slash critical race theory. That's what it, you know, is critical pedagogy uh, per frere is the thing that we don't want because it is divisive. It is a belief system. It is a theory it is not tied to fact. And this is why we criticize it. So there it is, the number one thing. Not whether it's going to stress kids out. because it, We don't want it. And not for nothing, we don't like the fact that we've been lied to, we've been gaslit for years that they're not doing this. And there they are saying they not only are doing it, mm -hmm. but that it's good that promotes race-based critical consciousness development by emphasizing critical analysis yep. of the world through the lens of racial privilege and oppression. That's why we don't like it. So stop lying and yeah. gaslighting people and saying, oh, what? We don't do that in so, school. And then and actually, it. you may want to look at in the paragraph above that where it talks about critical reflection and critical motivation, because those are the two things that actually did get measured um, in their thing. It's not um, it's not the frequency of the conversations at all. It was more so how did the students, you know, did they 
grow more in their critical reflectivity and critical motivation. They didn't measure the critical action part. And there's another thing that they didn't measure because that was recently found out to apparently not be so good of a measure. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> but, you know, again, if I want to speak in the vernacular, they really were looking to see how woke did we make them? Yeah, it's essentially the, essentially what it is. If you wanted to use the colloquial woke, yes. But um, like, what is it? Critical reflection refers to an individual's awareness of social inequality, which results from analyses of structural and historical roots of social inequities, um, racism, classism, sexism, ableism. Critical motivation involves individuals' political efficacy or the perceived agency to affect political and social change, either as an individual or as part of a collective. Right. Okay. So, so moving right along and, <laughs> uh, you know, then it says um, research suggests that exposure to anti-racist education and other forms of critical pedagogy can benefit students' development, especially for racially marginalized youth, but they don't tell us development of what. This is the thing, because I mean, I haven't read those particular studies, but you have to go sometimes when you're doing these kinds of things, if, if you all go do these reviews, sometimes you're going to have to do that. You're going to go back to the other studies and say, you know, what, you know, what are they actually saying they're about the development development of what? Because I would argue, given the context of this paper, those other papers are probably saying anti-racist, you know, education and other forms of critical pedagogy can benefit the student's development of critical consciousness. Is my guess at what they're saying? No mention of whether or not this that's link. Good. This link doesn't go to any other study. No, actually, when they do the links like this in the uh, in papers like this, it goes down to the references where it is in the references. So oh, you'd have to you'd have to scroll down to the reference list, but that's I see okay. something to do later. Yeah, a lot of the journals when it's online like this, that's what they'll do with the with the references is they'll point to where it is in the reference list, or there may be a pop up that shows up on the side of the screen or something like that with this article. This link refers to this reference, that kind of thing. Okay, so it's so, it's probably it probably is a real study. It's just it's not going to redirect you automatically from the article page. Okay, so just to ca catch us up here. So we started off with them telling us that the study was designed to measure the frequency, you know, the frequency and quality of conversations about race. And you're saying they didn't do that. Nope, they never did that. Okay. At least in my read of it, they never, they never have any okay. measure of that. Now let's get to the part that the, supposedly the meat of this, which is the stress thing. Um, did they at any point in this research define stress? <laughs> So I think, where is it? Um, ba -doo 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 -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. Tell me where to go and I'll go there. Yeah, I got I to gotta find it myself. Um, you might want to go down to the research questions first, which I think is partner school intervention context and evaluation approach. I think, it's, yeah, there it is. Okay. There's a bulleted list with what their actual research questions are here, which is always relevant to see what are the questions they were actually trying to answer. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. So like question one, are there distinct patterns of student engagement across the intervention components, you know, from reading the book to attending advisory periods and participating in discussion? I think at this juncture, it's probably a good idea to mention to them, uh, mention to our audience what the intervention itself actually was. Can I show a couple slides? Go for I'm, it. I'm not going to show you guys a ton of this because it's it's 174 pages long. Yeah. But while, while you bring that up, I'll just mention this was done over 10 weeks. Um, the students were asked to read a particular book stamped Racism, Anti-Racism and You, which is Ibram Kendi and another author involved. Um, and then the slides that Deb is showing is actually from the discussion groups where each week they would work through uh, work through the material um, and engage in that particular in the particular okay. discussion around the book, um, which you might be able to guess you, it gets worse as it goes along. <laughs> I am going to show you guys, um, you see how it has, uh, that show, they say four core concepts of effective, uh, communication. So I, I kind of went to that and it's interesting. It says, this is what we have, these concepts. Um, they say five core concepts, but whatever, here they are. Intent versus impact, pylon principle, explain away, advantage and disadvantage group identities, in-group, out-group, and language. And then I was curious, what do they mean by these? And the, this is literally um, what, in the coddling of the American mind, they talk about how, you know, the old saying is that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Intent versus impact is the sort of 
in inverted kind of version of that. The speaker may not think that if they didn't intend to harm that they should be forgiven, but the person harmed usually focuses on the impact. If your impact doesn't equal your intent, accept responsibility and make it right and apologize. So if you're wondering why the whole thing is like apologize, even if you didn't intend anything, they've been teaching students that it doesn't matter what somebody intended, they have to apologize to you. So mm -hmm. they can be offended all day long. Pile on principle is if someone responds strongly to your words, know that there's likely a long history of pain. So now again, this is the, I'm sorry, this is the one about that which doesn't kill me makes me weaker. Yeah. Um, because now it's like slavery. Well, you didn't live through slavery. It doesn't matter. I'm carrying the pile on of all of the many ancestors of whatever. And so this pain has been piled on for so long. So we're going to take whatever pain you can imagine or establish whatever and you know and just add it to a big pile of victim points and now me being defensive and critical of you and what you say is justified i get to basically tear you to shreds because of this supposed iceberg there's no responsibility on my part to deal with my iceberg yeah and then we're all supposed to show empathy and then the next one was explain away. explaining why someone's experience makes people feel dismissed this is when you say well wait a minute you weren't a slave how dare you explain away my pain or well, hang on, you live in a really nice house and your parents are together and it, 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 my parents are divorced, but how dare you explain away my thing? It's like, you know, or they talk about white splaining or mansplaining or any kind of splaining. They're just saying, validate me, validate me, acknowledge my, my experience, my lived experience and don't question it ever. Uh, and then we have obviously the advantage and disadvantage identity is everything. And notice it says, this is not the same as saying the individual members of disadvantaged groups are not powerful people. So, yeah. you know, you, you, that, that goes to like, well, wait a second, you're better off than I am. And, you know, how can you say I have white privilege? You know, it doesn't count. You still have privilege, even though my dad's a doctor and yours is like, you know, a plumber, whatever. Um, and then in group, out group language. Why is it acceptable? Some people say derogatory words or jokes, but not others. Fair or not, it is what it is. Like deal with it, cope with it, right? So when they were showing stuff to the kids and saying, you know, hey, there are these concepts of effective communication. Which I can guarantee you those don't actually work as effective concepts of communication, effective communication at all. I, I know a lot of communication scholars would be like, that's stupid. <laughs> well, they, all that was was a recipe for bullying. Yeah. Here are the five things that you can't do if you are not a minority. It is basically what it was saying. Here are the five things you have to watch out for and you have to do and the work that you have to do, the emotional labor, the the, the verbal labor, et cetera. And there is no way that people who are minoritized and majoritized, as they put them in the study, are going to come away from a training like this, not changing the, um, of the frequency with which they will talk to each other. Exactly. So whether they'll talk about race all the time isn't really the goal, is it? I thought the goal of these things was to eliminate racism and to improve our relationships with each other, not to improve how much we talk about race. Yep. I have no doubt this gets people talking about race all the damn time. That's not really a, a net good. A net good would be that if we talk about race, it's all it, it's to really bring us together. And every, all the five things I just showed you do not do that. And then they have, you know, discussion or speak from your truth give grace, assume good intentions, but doesn't that contradict the intent doesn't matter? Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, I mean, the, the, the assume good and don't assume somebody's intentions at all really is what I would go with. I mean, if you're feeling like offended or something that you could ask the question of, Hey, what did you mean by that? You know, exactly. Kind of you could ask that, but that's not what they're teaching those kids. Right. Also, I want to point out that this is supposed to be reading a book stamped from the beginning, but at every turn in this intervention, there's an opportunity for them to listen rather than read. Um, they also use misinformation. Black males were blank times more likely to be killed by police than their white counterparts between blah, blah, blah. It, again, we we the the researcher at Harvard who proved this false. Roland Fryer. Roland Fryer was like, you know, canceled, shamed, et cetera. And um basically charges were drummed up against him about sexual harassment, which weren't even true. Um, so anyway, this just goes on more listening. It's obviously, uh, you know, leading the witness here. What are the consequences of continued omissions about a history of racism and anti-racism in the U S presupposes the kids know enough to not challenge, you know, challenge you on that 
supposed factoid. Now, I, I do want to add a juncture to this because this was the slide suggested and developed for the teachers in this. The teachers who were running their discussion groups and things like that had the leeway to change and edit these a bit. Okay, fair enough. They did, uh, but this exists. But this was so, the basis. This was the basis that yeah. they were working from. And I'm going to take right. a wager, given everything else the teachers are doing, that they may not have changed this at all. Right. And um, I'm going to stop after this one because I want to show you that. See how they divide people into groups? They have anti-racist, segregationist, and assimilationist. Well, farther down in this, they have lots of these little sort the people exercises. Mm -hmm. And in one of them, they have uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, they have Booker T. Washington, and they have, who was the last one? I forget. It was, a, it's been uh, a bit Somebody, but they have another civil rights leader. And you're supposed to sort the people, and they've made Booker T. Washington a segregationist. He was absolutely not that. And I, it's like, it's crazy. So notice they get to say if they read the book or didn't read lots of listening. They don't have to read the book. Yep. They, at no point in time do you, you can have you can say you read book. the book just by listening, right? You so when they're doing the their research and evaluating, did you you know how engaged they are? The kid could say I was very engaged and have not read the book. Uh, one of the things I clicked into uh, to find out, you know what what was uh, one of the things that they were um, using as a sub, you know, one of those links I just showed you. It goes to this, the organization spiral. This is was this was potentially shown to kids. One of the links they could click to, building multi-ethnic, anti-racist, inclusive organizations and collaborations, and they have start, impetus, deny, ignore, impulse to quick fix, identify, assess, unpack white male privilege, build a multiracial organization, multiracial organization, refine, test, develop, sustain, start over again, impetus. This spiral, James Lindsay talks about this a lot. You're never done. No, the revolution it's the, it's is the never snake over. Eating its own, it's the snake eating its own tail. That's what it is. So I wanted to show that to um, give you some context. This thing goes on forever and a day. Um, yeah, because you know, I mean, they they did this over ten weeks. So there's they slammed all the slides together for this. So. Lots of stuff. And as it goes on, it gets worse, right? Like, hey, we're going to vote. We got to bring like camping equipment because it's so hard to vote. Um, you know the the. Like preventing voter fraud, and they say preventing uh, voter ID is not necessary. It's a lie. Uh, you know yeah. all these things. There's get a out the there's vote. a lot of opinions that are put to the kids as facts, and all of the videos and images they pick are cherry picked things, even from Frederick Douglass, to one side, one very clear side, which is critical race theory. So I just wanted to make sure that that was very clear. We were here, actually. Hold on, we were here. <laughs> you're yep. right it's du bois i'm sorry chris wood i i said du bois and it's du bois <laughs> uh, i say du bois too so i, mean. I know it's actually <laughs> pronounced du bois and then one time i said du bois and somebody tried to correct me they're like it's du bois and i was like i'm 99 sure it's du bois i've always heard it du bois <laughs> and then now i just said du bois and i was wrong so it is du bois actually he's a guy who was very prominent in the sort of Early days. You know who he was. He was a communist. Related things. Yeah. He was a communist. Um, but anyway. But, that, but that's the point to make in this, and that when they're talking about distinct patterns of student engagement across the intervention yeah. components, that's their first research question with this. And they're just trying to figure out what's the patterns of the students involved with right. reading the book, attending the advisory periods, and participating in discussions. Um, right. And those discussions in particular came up, you know, with the intervention days when they were actually sitting down with the slides and doing the jam boards and all that kind of stuff. The other three are the actually more substantive questions that were the um, that were the questions of interest. And you'll notice that none of the questions actually reflect the communication, you know, frequency and quality of conversations thing. That's not reflected in any of those questions. It's one of the other reasons I know they never actually did that in this particular study. Um, so yeah, pre-intervention school connectedness predict the overall stress and or uh, critical consciousness predict their patterns of engagement with the stamped intervention. So they're actually talking about, they're actually somewhat doing this in the reverse with that, where they're saying, okay, we can say the belonging and stuff like that, you know, does it predict the patterns of engagement with, with the uh, thing? So I don't necessarily look at that as an entirely relevant question because they, it's the reverse of what they actually would have been looking at, whether or not the intervention itself causes that 
level of stress or what have you or anything like that. So it's the reverse question. They're actually trying to predict the patterns of engagement based upon how a student is, you know, how, how, what kind of relationship they have with the staff, how they, how they feel about their belonging and the overall stress. Well, is that because they didn't really come up with any kind of controls to control for the kid is stressed for reasons other than this intervention? No, they, they never did that. That's one of the biggest problems I have with that is they did not address any of the other confound. Think of everything that's going on in a ninth through a 12th grader. Cause we're talking about high school students. You know, you'd know the age range off the top of your head better than I would. Mm-hmm. But the, um, Think about all the different things that are going on in the kid's life or potentially going on in the kid's life that, of course, you're having puberty changes going on. So (laughs) you're already probably stressed from that. Right. Um, And everything else. No. And COVID was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you had COVID going on right then, of course, with with the pandemic. But the only things that I saw they account for as confounders, perhaps, or things like that to, um, or other things that could be stressing the kids out. The only things that they included in the analysis of stress specifically was race, ethnicity, and the intervention itself. Nary any other thing in the world. <laughs> so if they indicated stress, they assumed it was the the study, or if they didn't assume if they didn't indicate that they felt stressed out, they said the study's fine. Well, that's funny because they kind of they kind of found both. Oh, explain. Help me uh, understand that. What do you mean? <laughs> wait, so, wait. So they found the study didn't stress anybody out, but all the stress they had was from other stuff. I mean, that was or the no. conclusion that they kind of came to at one point, which is the funniest part about it. But um, so how yes, do I they had stress, but it wasn't us. That's the idea is they, is they were basically oh trying to argue that, yeah, this, they had students who were stressed out. Because the way they tested all of this and the other two questions there kind of say that say it, do patterns of engagement and student racial identity predict the changes in school connectedness, overall stress and or critical consciousness after the intervention period? So did the intervention, you know, pre and post cause belonging to go down, cause stress to go up? Did it make them more critically conscious? Those are the actual questions that matter with respect to the intervention itself, right? Right. Um, and the second one after that is, a question I think is entirely a non sequitur. <laughs> and I will tell you why. During the intervention period, do students daily experience of belonging and stress differ on days when the intervention occurs? Do these effects vary as a function of the student's racial identity and patterns of engagement? So those are the only two co-found, uh, co found, um, co, the only other two variables they checked against, you know, racial identity and patterns of engagement when they're talking about both stress and belonging. They didn't do anything else. So we got four days a week. They're not participating in this across 10 weeks. Yep. And the only thing we're going to take into account if they report they're stressed or not stressed is their race and the, uh, the this particular intervention they haven't done that day. Yep. Or, or on the day that they have done it. Because one of the variables they include in that particular analysis is if it was an, if it was a discussion intervention day or not. You know, <laughs> I, 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 well, I'll tell you what, uh, there's a reason I a think scientist. that's, a, there's a reason that I, the reason that I think that's a non sequitur for their questions here about increasing stress is because that was over a 10 week period. And you guys already saw enough to know that that set of slides and all that discussion gets worse as it goes along. And so well, it, it builds does. up over time and things like yeah. that. So there's no way that looking at the stress on a particular day um, for when the intervention happens is going to actually mean anything. Um, for whether or not the intervention itself increased a student's level of stress. It's more of a question of after that, and particularly after the intervention, when you've gotten all the messaging and what have you, and now you're wrestling with it, and now you maybe have the cognitive dissonance or any number of other different things that are going on. So that that's, I think the daily stuff is a non sequitur, but I can show it, we can show it down in the, in the results section later, but basically right. from the results of the third question and the results of the fourth question, it looks almost like a contradiction, except for the fact that I think the daily stuff is a non sequitur. Um, because in the third question, they've, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like as that. We were get saying, all the time. It gets worse as it goes on. Um, I just like to point out that, um, they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they're saying that this is a black person, but this is a black person. Yeah. That's what they're saying. Not us. Not us. No, just to I point mean, it out. yeah, stereotypes. That these are stereotypes. 
and then that this is somehow a playoff on that. Yeah. But those are the same thing. And then, you know, how does the media perpetuate the narrative? It's a, I would go the other way. How do they take, you know, remember when Trayvon Martin, they put his little 10 year old picture. He looks so innocent and cute. And yeah. They say they, they do the opposite, but we don't talk about that, but it enjoy does. Your, get, enjoy your sorry. crawfish boil. No mo. Seriously. Um, then of course, redlining was only instituted to hurt black people and we get it. How would you define your cultural background? We get into yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Culture fest. And I think, You're, Deb, you probably put all the links in the description here. Oh, thank I, you, Nomo. Thank you so much, um, Nomo. Appreciate that. Thanks for the super chat. Um, yeah, Black Power, right? You know, there's Martin Luther King. I plan to lead another nonviolent march tomorrow. And I mean, you know, they probably came from the South or somewhere. I don't know where right. they came from, but they pick, they cherry pick the absolute worst examples. And then how about this one? This was yeah. called white resistance at the Capitol. And I'm sorry, did I miss the part where the Black Lives Matter were treated like this? Yep. That this was typical treatment? Diverse group of unarmed Black Lives Matter protesters sitting in the streets of but oh, the poor lambs. They, you know, after you burnt down several city blocks, they they actually used some force against you. Mm. So white resistance versus black resistance. This is this just goes on and on and on. Yeah. And you, I'm sure you linked all of this in the description. So yeah, I, mean, I did, I did. Okay, I know you were, you were probably thinking of looking at that separately in a different video, but for yeah. folks, I mean, I'd go have a look at it yourselves. <laughs> You'll see. You'll see. And, yeah. and it just makes what Adrian's pointing out about, you know, measuring the stress and on different days. It, yes. Because that's the other reason I get concerned about this is their measure of stress was based on a I mean, it's a fairly common stress metric for like the um, for the social sciences to use in general, but it's very generic self-reported questions because it's like, yeah, uh, perceived stress scale to explore the stress. So like they ask you during during the last 24 hours, if you're doing the daily thing, in each case, please indicate how often you felt or thought a certain way, zero being never, four being very often. In the last 24 hours, how often have you felt that you were unable to control the important things in your life? In the last 24 hours, how often have you felt nervous and, quote, stressed? In the last 24 hours, how often have you felt that you were on top of things? That's reverse coded. So when they go to do analysis, you know, the higher numbers, the higher numbers will be rated but lower. But there's no specific question of like, do you feel bad about being white? <laughs> yeah, there's no question specifically asked about that, which is what makes it interesting when you're talking about Confounder. That's the other reason I don't think the daily one is anywhere near as valid. What's going on in the last 24 hours? There's a heck of a lot more than that bloody discussion group. Right. That's going on in the last 24 hours. That could be about anything that's stressing them out. It could be a bad test score or something like that. It could have been, you know, you got your college letter back or something like that. And I'm not going to get into the college I want to get into. That's pretty stressful <laughs> for a college yeah. student, um, uh, for a college bound senior, for that matter. You know, that those kinds of things. None of that is accounted for with that fourth question. That's why I'm just like, that thing's a non sequitur because from day to day, you have no idea what's actually stressing that kid out. And yeah, it may not be the intervention, but you're not accounting for any of the other things that stress that kid out. You only accounted for what the student's racial identity is and how engaged they were in the intervention. And that's it. Every other confounding factor they could have accounted for, they didn't touch. That's probably why they didn't see any difference as a result of the intervention. They didn't account for anything that could have also been causing student stress on a given day. Now, getting now getting to the... Actually, the yeah, Where do you want me to go? Um, well, I mean, that table is relevant because that has to do with the sample. And I just point out some of the language that they use, like majoritized okay. versus minoritized. I hate that phrasing, to be honest, because it's just so it it's just subtle way to reinforce a uh, a false binary between people. So Right, right. It's just it's just disgusting to me. But that's the um that's what the sample looked like. Um okay. the only thing I was gonna say after that is this was. Um, I want to make a point about the IRB, which is in the procedures thing right below that. Yeah, right there. Study was approved by the Institutional Review Board at Duke University with a reliance agreement with the IRB at North Carolina State University. So two universities working together, one will approve and then the other university just relies on the judgment of Duke University, etc. Something like that. 
Two weeks before um, pre and post stamp data collection, the school informed all parents and guardians of the surveys included and included information on how to opt their children out of participation. Approximately 30 students were opted out of each survey by their parents. Students who did not opt out of participation and assented had a approximately 45 minutes to complete the surveys during an advisory period pre-test and extended class period post-test. Teachers introduced the study by reading a script that and directing students to their school email for the survey links. Following assent, students completed the survey in English or Spanish. If they did not finish during the allotted period, students had one week to complete the survey on their own time. So you didn't have to complete the survey at school either. So the Lord only knows well, what else is that, going on. So wouldn't that affect your results in terms of like, if I'm fin finishing it on my own time, that's going to affect my stress level and yep. like, Who is knows that what an happened? accurate reflection yeah. of anything? Yeah. Who knows what's going on in the kid's life when you get home and something, something blew up in your face at home and then you're completing a survey afterwards. Well, yeah. When you're completing a survey in that moment, then yeah, you're really stressed, but it ain't about school. <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah. I'm at home, so I'm chill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who knows exactly. what? But the reason I wanted to bring this up for folks who are unfamiliar, um, and particularly if you have something like this come to your own school, you have the right to question and challenge every single thing with these reviews as much as you are comfortable, not just with the authors. The authors are supposed to be very responsive, but not just with the authors, but you have the right to bring any of your concerns and complaints to the Institutional Review Board. And by law, they must they would have had to tell the parents this was approved by the institutional review board at x university here's the number if you want to contact them with concerns so just as a note for parents if you ever see something like this come up in your own schools you have absolutely the right to express your concerns and challenge anything you're concerned about with the institutional review board and with the authors of the research um so you do not have to sit back and just you know opt your kid out you can ask them very specific questions about what they're doing and why and what kind of problems and harms they see and things like that. You have the right to ask and question everything as a participant in the survey. Um, now, there's also $50 gift cards. Yes. So the, I've done a video on this on my own channel about this kind of stuff. So um, the reason IRBs and things like that came about has to do with in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, there were a lot of really terrible experiments on human subjects, be it the things the Nazis did or other things like that. And so there were a lot of rules and guide rails put in place that were built around three specific principles in that you had to have respect for the agency of the person who was a participant. You had to um, engage in what's called beneficence, which is to say, give something good, You know, just don't make it awful for folks. Um, and you had to minimize harms as much as possible. And so that's that's what the IRBs are looking to balance out anytime you go get any kind of re review done for a, for a study you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, they have to ch check on all of those different things to make sure, you know, you're respecting the agency of the person. This is where informed consent comes in. All of these parents would have had to sign informed consent for their kids because the kids don't have agency. They're not old enough. All the parents who opted into this would have had to sign the informed consent documents. Um, and then from there, it's just a question of minimizing harms and maximizing benefits. Um, and that's usually kind of, in, that's where those incentive things kind of kind of uh, come is, you know, gift cards and charity, things like that to maximize the incentive to take part. Um, right. Um, so there's so a longer video about that on my channel, so you can go find that. But just to make a point on what all that's about. But okay, you absolutely so have the right to challenge anything when you get one of these kinds of survey things come to ask, have your questions answered before you sign any documents. And you have absolutely the right to refuse at any moment, not just at the beginning or at the end. This is probably one of the reasons why the attrition rate got so bad is a bunch of parents realized this is bad shit and they decided their kids can't do it anymore. Right. <laughs> now, question. We were talking about this yesterday and we were yep. talking specifically about the result, the stress results. Yeah. What did you find? Because remember in the title of the whole thing is like, it didn't cause stress. Yeah. Which so, is pretty much the money point, right? Like, I mean, that's what they want you to read the headline. They want you to, if you, even if you read the first couple paragraphs, they want you to come away as a lay person from reading the study, believing any teacher in the future, or you, you know, you just believing anybody in the future that tells you 
doing anti-racist interventions in your school does not stress out kids. That's the core belief they want you to have from now until mm -hmm. eternity. No matter what they call anti-racist intervention, they want you on your research shows. It doesn't cause stress. Yes. Research that's research based. So how about it? Does it show that? Go down to, it's just after table three, where they actually say it themselves. Um, always like to go into the text and let them let them do it. So it's just after table three um, in the results section. So this is uh, table three. So keep going down a little bit more because it's... There's table four. Uh, the way they arrange it on the web may be different from the way it is in the PDF. So you might oh, have to sorry. scroll a little bit. That's okay. No, it happens. It happens. Prediction. I just use the PDFs because it's easier to highlight. Things. Sure. Um, keep on going because it's not there. Um, okay. This is it. This is what I was looking for. Go up a little bit. Up, 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 up. Right there. Stress. Stress. Okay. Stress. So results for perceived stress reveal a significant main effect of time, which was qualified by significant time race interaction. The time class three we counted for. Okay. The paragraph right after that post hoc analysis of the time race interaction revealed that racially minoritized students stress increased from intervention to post intervention. However, majoritized students' stress did not differ between time points. Racially majoritized and minoritized students' stress did not differ from each other at either time point. That's what they say there. So in other words, translate that, for the kids who are not white, stress went up pre and post intervention from this intervention. So remember, they measured pre-intervention and three months after the actual intervention itself. So this would have been in the spring of 2021, right? And so it did actually increase the stress. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it just um, increased it for the brown kids. Yeah. For all the kids who are not white, who is supposedly this is supposed to help. Uh-huh. <laughs> so they tell us it doesn't. And then they tell us in the article, I want to go back to that real quick. If you don't mind, it says up here, it says, um, Where's the part about hinges on, uh, da, da, da. oh, a lot of the opposition to addressing racism in schools hinges on the idea that anti-racist programming is somehow harmful or stressful to students. Now, they didn't say white students. They didn't say black students. They said students. So presumably, if it stresses out anybody, it counts as harmful or stressful to students. Correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, so then saying didn't stress out kids is not exactly accurate. No. It no, just stressed it's not out not an the, accurate statement. The black and brown kids. That to me is actually pretty damning. <laughs> because See, this is why you got to if you read a news release like this, really any news release with a scientific article, take it on good practice to just go and find the article and read it if you can because you know, you don't need to necessarily be an expert in statistics to read their own words and see that even they say that that's not true. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> what have we learned here today, Adrian? You know, always be careful with surveys, you know, uh, no, well, not surveys, with news releases. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is another one that the study says, but it didn't say that. This is really another one of those. Um, okay. And so, you know, so it, so we have to sum it up. We have a news release telling us some that a study said something it didn't actually say. We also have a news release that tells us it studied something it didn't actually study. Remember, they started out telling us they were studying their frequency and quality of racialized of uh, racialized conversations, and they never actually even looked at that at all. Mm -hmm. And and they didn't tell us in the news release that a key function of the intervention was to raise critical consciousness. Mm -hmm. now, so that the definition of anti-racism intervention is raising critical consciousness. Now, here's here's the thing afterwards that I want, want you to look in the next very next paragraph on critical reflection because it's about perceived inequality, right? That second paragraph right there in the graphic will be helpful too. 
we report results of the time class race interaction because it qualifies it. The perceived inequality increased from intervention to post intervention for both racial and majoritized and minoritized students in the highly engaged class. However, the critical uh, reflection did not differ between engagement classes at either time point. Uh, racially majoritized students perceive greater inequality than their minoritized counterparts in the highly engaged group at both time points. So the white kids got more critically conscious. The black kids got more stressed out. What does that do to society, <laughs> do you think? <laughs> but this is great, guys. Don't worry. It doesn't do any harm. See, this, this is the thing. You, this is this is where people do actually have a problem with it, in, in with the critical theory kind of nonsense. And we talked about it before in that you might be actually telling a kid now that you're basically teaching a kid that you're, you know, your life is going to suck because you're of X, um, X group of people and this is going to happen to you and this is going to happen and this has happened to you. And look at how things are awful for you. Repeated messaging like that over time to a kid who maybe hasn't formed the ability to think differently about it yet. I could see how that would actually cause stress to increase. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens in a lot of this training material. So I'm just like, yeah, why are you surprised that over time, maybe not on the intervention day, but that's not what we're worried about with this. Like I said, I think the intervention day thing is another non sequitur. Um, you know, it, it's increasing over time, the amount of stuff where you're saying to a kid and putting it more into their head that you know, you're part of X group, therefore you're going to have a harder time of life. And society has been has been awful to you and continues to be awful to you because of X thing that you have no control over. Remember, one of those stress questions was about how much control you feel like you have in things in your life. Well, you're telling a kid they have no control. That's right. But this is fascinating. And we didn't really talk about it, but I bet you there's a whole research study that could be done on this if someone were responsible. Notice we see the solid black line is the highly engaged minoritized person that their, their critical consciousness went way up. In other words, their critical specifically, consciousness. Specifically, this is critical reflection, which is about the inequality perceived. Okay. So perceived inequality went way up from where it was. Okay. But notice it started at a lower point. So what I find so fascinating about this is that the majority kids had a perception of inequality that was at a higher starting point before the intervention than the minority person. Yep. And it went up in both cases, whether they were highly engaged or not highly engaged, which is very interesting because it makes me wonder. So the kids are not even highly engaged in this whole intervention. Their perception of inequality still went up with the intervention. Yeah. Even though they weren't highly engaged and the only ones on the minority side or, you know, that, that went up was the highly engaged. Yep. Actually, that's not true. The highly engaged and the highly engaged majority, highly engaged minority, they both went up. But yeah. The so you can't, minority you can't see it. You can't see it very well. And this is what I call a bad graphic for that reason. Um, the black dash, dash line, yeah, it's right under the blue dash line. So the disengaged majority and the highly engaged majority started from the same place and ended in the same place, which says to me the intervention did nothing. <laughs> right. And did nothing for that group of students. Yeah, but they still, they started at a higher point to start with. Yeah. And, but I just would love to get inside the heads of the kids who were disengaged, the disengaged majority kids. Their line mirrors the highly engaged majority kids. Yep. Like you said, it did nothing, whether they were engaged or disengaged, but it, it in terms of, but it still went up a little and it's still, they still start hard. So majority kids, white kids still perceive more injustice than the black kids. Right. Even with this thing. And so like, what was the need for it in the first place? And it seems to me like to create stress and create awareness of racism on the part of the minority kids. Mm -hmm. So what you're done here is it seems to me, I could be wrong, but that you've taught the majority population of kids who were in this engaged or disengaged, it doesn't matter that they are still on top. Yep. Y'all are still very powerful. So why would you feel super stressed out unless you feel super guilty? 
and you're teaching the kids who before had a low perception of racial inequality, low the lowest of anybody in the group. Mm -hmm. And it goes skyrocketing upward and they conveniently are the ones who are also more stressed out. So they're becoming more aware of race, more aware of racism, and they're more stressed out. That strikes me as harmful to the very people you claim to care about. Yeah, that would that would be anything. I just want to respond to see the whole truth in the in the question asked for this. Um, that that uh, two colleges paid for this one. Um, two colleges didn't pay for this. Um, I will say, see the whole truth. This was not funded by the universities themselves. This was funded by the American Education Research Association. Um, but they worked in partnership with a local public school. Given that I think all three universities are in North Carolina, I'm going to guess this was a North Carolina public school where they did this. Um, no way of knowing for sure, because I mean, you're supposed to protect, protect the anonymity of the kids. But anyway, just, just right. to make the point on that. And Esteban said, they don't realize that their way of thinking causes kids that aren't white to be low self-esteem and they can't achieve anything. That's our, one of our biggest problems with it, Esteban. That's part of why... You know, when yep. they said like their, their complaint hinges on, it'll stress people out. I'm like, not the people you think. Cause when they argue that they claim that white parents don't want it cause we're fragile. When in fact, a lot of very well-meaning educators and other parents are like, no, no, we don't want it because it's not good for kids, period. Especially the minority kids. Yeah. Yeah. Espe and if you believe half of what you're saying, you're hurting kids in the minority. Yeah. And I will say, you know, I, I don't I don't like to be mean and throw everybody on the bus and say that everybody is doing this deliberately because I can see some I can see Rhonda's question too. And I don't think I don't think everybody's intentionally doing this deliberately because I think there is a desire to generally help kids do better, regardless of what things they come from. And so some people implement these things and they're well meaning about it. I don't want to do that to all the I don't want to say all the teachers are evil, kind of thing like you do. Sure. I don't want to say that. So I'm sure there's some folks who where this is a deliberate thing. But I don't think it's everybody. And I think it's well-meaning folks who don't realize that in this case, the research is not necessarily going to point to good things. But by their own definition, it doesn't matter what they intended. All that matters is the <laughs> outcome. Yeah, no, I had he, to say it. You no, know no, no. I had to say it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we don't we don't know that for sure, Rhonda, but it's I can only I'm, I'm not gonna speculate on the reasons why they, they like this kind of stuff. But um, I just know that it's I'll probably not my good neck out when it comes to Kendi. Well, Kendi, yes. Kendi, I think, is a grifter. But <laughs> I'm going to stick my neck out and say that his entire career and everything that he stands for, as well as all the other people who work with him on these projects. No, no. Um, absolutely. Of, to, your, to your point about the straw man, about this being stressful for white kids, I had to go back and find it because it's in the um, it's in the conclusions, actually, of the article. I'll just read it. So. To address our third research question, we examined whether changes in students' belonging, quality of student-staff relationships, stress, critical reflectivity, and critical motivation occurred as a function of their level of stamped engagement and racial, racial ethnic identity. To our knowledge, our study is the first to consider socio-emotional outcomes of anti-racist interventions in addition to components of critical consciousness, which are important to consider as critics of anti-racist education argue that learning about racism may be psychologically harmful to white students. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> to white students. <laughs> so there they said it. There they said it. So as long as it doesn't bother the white children, it doesn't stress anyone out. Anybody seeing it? Like, I mean, yep. who's the racist? Yep. Who we are the racists? Hold there? on, hold on, hold on. We found that over time, participants reported reduced belonging in school, more stress, especially for racially minoritized students, and higher quality relationships with staff. However, these changes did not vary as a function of the intervention engagement. Now, the only reason they're saying that, the last part, is because of the daily stress things, not because of the pre and post test things where they did before the whole 10 weeks and three months after the whole 10 weeks. They're saying that because of that daily thing that I tell you is a non sequitur. And I tell you it's a non sequitur because God only knows what's going on in that kid's life in a given day that they never accounted for because the only thing they accounted for in those models aside from stress and belonging, was the intervention itself and what race the kid was. That's it. <laughs> wow. All right. Anything like, else in this that we missed? Um, I don't think so. I mean, the only the only thing that I could mention, because um, right after that, I think, is where they talk about the daily models and some of the, you know, right after that graphic, I think, is... 
Oh, I keep forgetting it's arranged differently, but that's okay. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, like the, they're starting to talk about the daily stuff and they're talking about the individual models. Daily so basically, belong I just find it utterly absurd that they tried to measure someone's sense of belonging. I forget exactly what the, oh yeah, no, here's, here's what they asked in terms of the belonging questions. So this set of questions asks you about your thoughts and feelings today in school. There are no right or wrong answers because people may feel very differently from just from one another. Just so our results are going to be completely meaningless because there's <laughs> <laughs> just read each statement carefully and answer honestly. So one is strongly disagree. Five is strongly agree. Today, I felt like I belonged at name of school. Today, I felt connected to name of school. Today, I felt welcomed at name of school. That is their measure of belonging for each student. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck does it mean to be connected to? to? What the heck does it mean to belong to? This this is my pet peeve with survey questions is that I talked about this with Kira and I talked about this with other things in that I think I've talked about it even on this channel a few times. The problem with some of those kinds of things is that you are relying on the student or whomever is doing the survey to hopefully have the same definition of belonging that you do. Thank you. I, you know me, I'm a word nerd. And mm -hmm. so they use a word like belonging. I'm like, well, blah, 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 blah. I mean, like, what, what does why that mean? Not just speaking so it's sling like, on. I it's mean, like what the does other that one, mean? Yeah, it's like the other one we did the other week on the merit question. There were always they were relying entirely on the participant participants to have a conception of a meritorious process or a job hiring process in mind. They never actually described what that process was in that survey. One moment, the other one we did the other week. Right, right. It's the same kind of thing. If you are not actually being specific, this is the process. This is what we mean by belonging. You know, define it for the students when they're taking the survey. Yeah. Then you're relying on the student's conception, which is not necessarily going to be the same as your own. And, you know, I, I have to agree with Rhonda. Some people, not all, do these things deliberately because they're pushing an agenda. Yeah. I, I can't shake it because I, I feel like you, there's... And as I said, the intervention designers themselves 100% clearly have an agenda. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You guys, it's down in the description. You can click on it. You can scroll through it. You can see for yourselves. It's super clear. There's also links within the presentation. There's dozens and dozens of links to click into more other stuff and videos. And it, it, it's so clear what the agenda is. As far as the study writers, I don't know if I'll say agenda. I won't go that far, but I will say they're critical theorists. I absolutely will yeah, say. Yeah, no, I agree with that. There's no question they have hard bias towards critical theory, which makes them by, you know, sort of the, the colloquial leftist. Mm -hmm. You don't sit there and go, well, Paula Freire teaches us like it's fact, like this is our lens that we put on every time we approach education research and then ask to be treated as if you're neutral. That's utterly ridiculous. Freire had a very specific liberatory revolutionary communist practice, collectivist to the core. So you don't get to wipe that off yourself when you do this research. So they absolutely had at least the agenda of demonstrating that mm -hmm. uh, Paulo Freirean approaches to things are correct, and which is a whole separate research project that should be done. But um, it would have to take years and that would be unethical because you'd be experimenting on kids with their lives. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you, I think if you go down to table six, I think, oh, not table six, table eight, I think, um, because that's, I think you might've found it already, but. This one. Wait, which one is this? This no, is table seven. seven. One more. One more table. Yeah, eight. there it is. Cause this is, this has to do with all the modeling that they were doing to figure out, you know, does stress on a given day increase because you're just on the, you know, on the actual day of intervention kind of thing. But you're going to notice along the left-hand side is the effects that they actually measured. Like, what's the race? Did they attend, you know, with third English group? You know, is English, English not, I don't, I don't, I think a third English group stands for something else, but, but notice there's nothing about, you know, what's going on in a kid's life. And you can scroll down further and see it because there's a couple of different versions that they did, but like that, that day times racing, that's an interaction component. Like, the day of intervention and what race the student is at the same time being factored. So that's why I was just like, these things don't matter because how do you know the lesson isn't sinking in for the kid and then coming in a few days later or a few months later? That's what the early results very much suggest in that 
yeah, over time, this built up and it did cause the kids a lot of stress. May not have on the day because God only knows what's going on in that kid's life. But, <laughs> you know. Well, and, and they, they keep saying that they're evaluating, they're, they're measuring engagement to see if it has any, if there are any patterns with engagement. Mm -hmm. And the only pattern I saw is that it doesn't matter whether a white kid is engaged or not engaged, their perception of racial inequality went up. Oh, I see. Third, third in group refers to the difference between highly engaged and disengaged. Okay. Sorry. I just couldn't remember what the heck yeah, it was. But I mean, I find that to be noteworthy. Yeah. yeah. And yet it's not mentioned. Yeah. But I think related to the stress, oh, there's what? a good section in limitations. Always look in a study when you're looking at these things for what the limitations of the study are and if they are acknowledged by the authors. Okay. Um, where is this. that? Uh, it's closer to the end. It's in the discussion. Um, for Here we sure. go. Limitations. Yeah. So limitations. Findings from this evaluation highlight the benefits of employing multiple methods to evaluate anti-racist interventions. Not really, but anyway. However, our findings are not generalizable to other student populations or even to the full population of our partner school because of the limited participation rate and the high attrition in the context of online learning and because of the unique school community and social historical context. So they very clearly say, although they cannot be generalized, but let me just refresh your memory. <laughs> <laughs> they, Beware they, of news releases. <laughs> they can't be generalized, guys, but, but this. It's yep. evidence-based, you guys. I, I have to keep doing this because I can't tell you how many people, and I'll be on X or I'll be somewhere and, you know, people say, okay, can you just, I just, just tell me, why is SEL bad as an example? Or why is CRT bad? Why is it bad? But it's evidence-based. They told at my school, they said evidence-based, but it's evidence-based, isn't it? And I'm like, what? Can you define evidence? Who produced the evidence? Do you understand the evidence? Did you look at the evidence? Do you know what the evidence actually shows versus what they claim that it shows? You know, like there's so many unanswered questions, but they hear the word evidence and it's like evidence based. Yeah. What evidence? But these are the same people who said, these are the same people who basically said, if you didn't, you know, and then you were, you know, going to mm -hmm. hell, you mm -hmm. should be put in a this camp. This is why I wore this shirt today. Houston, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> We, we do. Uh, the trust the science is that needs to be consigned to the I know. Of I, I hate that particular phrase. I absolutely despise that particular phrase because yeah. that is not how any scientists themselves think. You shouldn't yeah. just automatically trust something because it was done by a scientist yeah. or a researcher. And like the automatic trust of things has this is a minor tangent, but a point to make in this is that. I, I, there's all the things about scientific racism and what have you like that and all the evil things that science has done, right? Is, I, here, here's a question. Has that happened at points when science has actually been focused on its job of figuring out what the truth is about certain things, be it societal or be it physical, natural related things? Or has that happened when ideological crap has gotten into science? Every Bingo. single time in history I could find it has always been because ideology and a desire for specific something to be what it is has trumped actually looking for what the truth is. And exactly. that is something you have to remember when you're looking about these things. And so like Trofim Lysenko is the prime example of that. He's, he's the greatest mass murderer in scientific history effectively because his ideas led to mass famines, not just in the USSR, but his ideas were also implemented in Mao Zedong's China early on. And so it caused a famine there too. And millions of people died. As and they're all. about to cause one in the West. Yes. <laughs> they're about to cause one in the West. We we also have medical Lysenkoism going on right now. In every single session you see where they're like, we're gathered here to talk about medical equity and to talk about how we need to achieve it in our surgical practice and things. And then Advil, pain equity. We're going to have that. Like, what? And then what's coming out of WPATH? It, you know, but it's a gender identity, you know, we can't measure it or see it or touch it or feel it or, you know, evaluate it or whether it's real or not. You get to self-diagnose, mm -hmm. by the way, don't you know? And you can self-define what your treatment is too as the patient. So yeah, that's but quite Actually, creepy. if you want to go back, you want to go back to the study for a second, because I forgot one thing about the, the stress part of it. 
go back up to where that thing about the white students was in the discussion. Uh, longer term outcomes of stamped engagement, I think. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Just to that paragraph right there where it starts with concerningly. Yep. Concerningly, Concern racially minoritized students perceived stress increased, whereas racially majoritized students' stress remained stable between fall 2020 and spring 2021. Although stress was unrelated to the intervention engagement. Again, they draw that off of their daily thing, which I don't think matters in, <laughs> in this at all. Right. While the current study cannot explain with certainty why racially minoritized students reported increased stress post-intervention, it has long been documented that experiencing racism is associated with adverse psychological outcomes, including increased stress rates. Wow. So they just explained it away. We're not even gonna. We're not even gonna acknowledge that our intervention could have played a role. It's just ex uh -huh. experiencing racism. Yeah, like like I said, the racism I, they experienced in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I'll hammer this. I'll hammer this again and again. The daily thing doesn't matter because on that day, God only knows what's going on in the kid's life because they didn't account for it. That kind of thing. Also, and the whole intervention was built up over the time and got worse. And by the end, you are pushing the message, particularly to the minoritized kids, although I, I don't like that word used for those kids, but um, that, you know, the world is against them. You're pushing everything that everything is awful. And look at all this historical, you know, historical racism and all this other kind of stuff that you have no control over. So your life is going to be awful. You're pushing that message to the kids. And you're thinking that didn't increase their level of stress over time. Well, and, and I just, I mean, it's appalling to me that they put into their study, the white kids, you know, increase the stress of the white kids. No, it remains stable. Well, at the other, the stress of the black kids increased, but that's up to, that's owing to other stuff. Yeah. Even though we are measuring it pre-intervention and post-intervention and it went up post-intervention, it wasn't us. What? No, we didn't have to do that. <laughs> it was other stuff. Like we... We, we don't know any of the things going on in anybody's lives, but we're just going to assume when it's convenient for our outcome to say that it was not us. Mm -hmm. And I wow. will say, they, they go on to say that, you know, disproportionately major, major mortality rates targeted racial violence da, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Well, wait a second. You have race as a component in there. Did it increase because of that with your daily things or like all that when you were talking about this stuff? Who, who knows? But they didn't account for anything as well as they needed no. to with that daily they test. That's why I don't this, think it's good. They went into this with a, a preconceived set of, of beliefs that they carried through the entire project. Mm -hmm. And then as they got data that they either didn't understand or couldn't really reconcile, they just magically attributed it to things and then concluded that, nope, doesn't cause any adverse stress in white kids. No, and at least by their metric, it doesn't, but. <laughs> well, I mean, why would you? Because you've just, the entire presentation quite correctly. Remember, Ibram X. Kennedy goes, no, we don't tell white people that they're bad. If you look at the, pre the, the slides, that is true. It doesn't yeah. go right out and say, like Robin D'Angelo does, or even uh, some of the intersectional stuff does. That presentation of Stamp from the beginning that, and all that doesn't say, white people are inherently bad. It shows all the bad things that are done to black student, black yep. and brown. Yep. And so it really doesn't surprise me that the white student's stress level would remain stable, but whether they're engaged or not engaged, because nothing in that is a, is a threat to them. Mm -hmm. Basically saying like, you guys are good. It all, everything is going to go your way. It's fine. It's these guys that are picked on. So the, and you're not going to necessarily, why would you feel guilty? Because it didn't say it's because of you. That's Robin DiAngelo's job. Yep, that's the job of other, t you know, intersectionality other, and stuff. Other kinds of those interventions would do that, which is again why this right. is not generalizable at all. No, this is a completely different kind of intervention, and this one seems absolutely tailor made to make blacks to activate black students and brown students uh, to being angry, stressed out, frustrated, vote Democrat. Clearly, I mean, if you go through the slides, you guys, again, it's down below. You should, it's so crystal clear which way you're supposed to vote. I mean, yeah, they put so much, they put so many opinions about what they should do and shouldn't do. And don't let the yeah. kids actually think about it for themselves. Not at all. They don't even force you to read the book. Yep. It's like, did you read? Oh, well, if you didn't read here, do this other thing instead. So they, you, they give you pre-digested opinions, pre-digested data, half of which is really slanted or all the way wrong, like incorrect. And all of it paints a picture that today's America is literally no better. 
yep. no better whatsoever than Jim Crow America. Mm -hmm. So I have no doubt that that it contributed in some measure to the stress levels and the increased perception of racial injustice and so forth and so on. So yeah, that's what I would argue based on their own data and the slides they used with the students, that that's exactly why, even if it's not on a given day. But then again, you didn't account for everything you needed to account no, for to actually no. possibly break so, it down to see the intervention day effect. No. So as usual, this is. Yep. The hey. only other, the only other thing I will say is they did actually uh, acknowledge the limitation of, you know, recalling how much of the book you how much of the book you read in the right because people thing. lie yeah <laughs> yeah i read the book uh-huh yeah, yeah i read it mm -hmm. that's something they say later on as one of their limitations second our measurement of intervention engagement was limited to three items that asked students to retrospectively recall their participation across the intervention three months after it concluded Oy. thus it is possible that adolescence engagement reporting was somewhat inaccurate it's possible <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit possible three months later that they're, which they're already unlikely authenticity of the, oh, okay. Uh, during COVID while they're home. Um, anyway, the last thing that, what did you want to just quickly show people what, what the sign that this, this other thing is going on? Cause I don't know if there's much to say about it from here. What other no, thing? it won't let me do it. The science of parenting. Oh, um, I mean, time. you could do it off the screenshots I sent you on Discord, but right now it's behind the paywall and I can't access it from here. So yeah, I can't um, either. So but we, I say, can, we, we can mention it real quick. So okay. <laughs> you, guys or you can know, share it here. You can share screen. Well, I don't think I have access to it either from where I am, but I know I sent oh. you the whole, all the screenshots I took off my phone. Okay. Um, they're in your Discord thing, I think. I'll see if I can find it, but go ahead. Tell what, what's happening. So those of you who don't know, um, Scientific American might be might be uh, retitled Unscientific American, given some of its commentary. But um, in the last few years, they've, they've recently started a new column on the science of parenting, actually. So they're going to be doing articles on parenting from the scientists talking about, you know, how to parent. <laughs> that oh, my kind God. Of thing. So um, it's uh, the first art. The initial article just introducing the column is what I sent Deb previously. That's what we were initially going to do this show on. But yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's behind the paywall on scientific American i know right i now, can't so it's, it's like even if i download the pictures um this, i think i could that's the problem is that like they come out really small I'm and we can't see them but yeah i mean from what i can tell scientific american or unscientific american rather is launching a new column about parenting to evaluate the staggering amount of information available and the evidence behind it so the problem i have with this is your second handers are not going to be Deb and Adrian. And I mean, you yeah. might not trust us either. I don't know. That's fine. It's going to be Scientific American. Scientific American is going to go read and digest. First of all, they're going to pick which studies to show you. Then they're going to digest it for you and tell you what to think about it. Don't you trust them? Aren't these the same people? What, mm -hmm. what, have, what have we learned from Scientific American lately, Adrian? Well, Scientific American has gone, I know a whole bunch of scientists who are so sad at what's happened to Scientific American because when it was first founded, it was really, really great about articles yeah. and things like that. But the editor-in-chief who took over recently is a former editor from Slate. So that oh, tells you about well, that's the, awesome. <laughs> that tells you about the bias that's introduced there. Yeah, it's great. But, um, yeah, no, it, I think, I mean, if we wanted to, we could probably just read off the screenshots for folks who are listening, but yeah, sure. Um, so let's see. There's a lot of parenting advice. Up. Yeah. Okay. When I first became a mom, I was buried under the avalanche of information you could find on how to be a good parent. Try this. Don't try that. Do this. Don't do that. But this don't buy this. Don't buy that. For every possible question, there were a billion different answers from a billion different people. As a science journalist, I had to put my training to use. What was their evidence? What were their incentives? Could I trust this expert or that? Uh, to this day, as things crop up with my kids, I still try to dig through data. Is, my, is what my kid doing normal? Usually. Has this medicine been tested on children? Usually not. Is screen time okay? It depends. <laughs> is there any part... Um, uh, is there any part of the internet that is safe for kids? Ha, ha, ha. Which I kind of would agree with that sentiment, actually, but that's a whole different thing. The way I see it, if I'm asking these questions, so are millions of parents worldwide. And if I'm confused, I'm not alone. To try and cut through the noise around parenting and child development, Scientific American is launching the Science of Parenting, 
a regular column offering evidence-based advice on issues related to parenting and parent-child relationships, including caring for our elderly parents. You'll hear from researchers who are studying some of the most interesting biological, psychological, and sociological questions around raising children. You'll hear from journalists and writers who are reporting deeply on these relationships and the questions they raise. And you'll hear from parents themselves on how they've gotten through issues that span infancy to adulthood. Uh, we know that what works for one family will not always work for the next. We want to look at what people are saying in the quest to raise good humans and see if those claims, A, have been examined and B, can be backed up. We want to help cut through all the clutter to better understand what is real and what is fake. So please send us what you want to know. Send your ideas and questions to opinion at siam.com. And we want to be clear, this isn't a column just for parents. It's for any of us who are child adjacent, whether your role is cool aunt, fun uncle, step parent, grandparent, guardian, or simply someone who cares. Furthermore, this column isn't just about babies, toddlers, tweens, and teens. It's also about adult children. And for so many of us in our sandwich years, becoming a parent to our parents. Generational relationships define societies, drive policy, and for better or worse, define politics. If some of the pieces we run in this column can help you be a more informed member of the electorate, we would be thrilled. Now, is that really the job here with this column? But anyway, when we first, uh, when my first, when my first was a baby, I'd look at her and wonder, what are the best, what's the best way to do this? I'd read, I'd query friends, I'd query, I'd query random parents. And of course, I'd ask my mom and dad. Sometimes I'd even do what they suggested. Don't tell them this. It will only make them smoke. With my second... I mine the recesses of my mind and say, what did I do last time? And then I'm like, wait, do we still do that now? And start those calls and queries all over again. It is very true what they say, raising a considerate, ethical, compassionate, human, happy human really does take a village. We at Scientific American would be honored if you would add us to yours. Well, if I may, if you're interested in what they're trying to do, which is sort of a noble thing, Right. I mean, there is a lot of research that might be of interest to parents. But before if I if I if I may be so bold as to suggest a book that you read before you decide you're going to subscribe to Scientific American and see what their <laughs> stuff is, because, I mean, I'd love to tell you that Adrian and I will make a whole series out of evaluating every parenting research study that's going to come for it. We can't. We won't. It's not going to happen. But there, there are better a, things we all might want. to Yeah, do with our we have we have we have other things to do. <laughs> um, but there is a book that I suggest you get. It is called Nurture Shock. And um, it was written by Poe Bronson and um, Ashley Merriman. Let me bring this up and show you, because I also have a Kindle version of it so I can show you the table of contents. But this book, the reason I'm suggesting this book, New Thinking About Children, but and, and by the way, this was published in 2011. So you might think, well, I mean, is it still current, whatever? I think so from the standpoint that what they did was they took research that had been shelved because it was a little inconvenient in many cases, you know, things like that. Um, it was released in hardcover in 2009. It remained in the New York Times bestsellers for three months. It was one of Amazon's bestselling books, blah, blah. Uh, it says... So it tells you a little bit what it's about, but what I found so fascinating was that it covers some of the questions that we ask so often, and it comes up with really shocking answers because what they did is they went back and looked for the literature. They looked through yeah. research done over decades and decades and decades and said, how come nobody knows about this? How come this really well done research study got shoved on the shelf and replaced with other stuff that's garbage, <laughs> like total bullshit. And we think of it as like the be all end all of child rearing. So you have chapters like the inverse power of praise. Seems pretty relevant today, don't you think? Uh -huh. it's sure, he's special, but new research suggests if you tell him that, you'll ruin him. It's a neurobiological fact. And so when you read the book, it actually cites the research, which you can then go read on your own, that shows what we now know in 2024, that constantly affirming and validating and praising and you're so special and this, the whole the whole thing. But think about kids who were born in 2009. 
Yep. Okay. So they're now 14. That's just if they were born then. When the research was done, which was long before 2009, they just kind of went, that's really inconvenient because we're already selling lots of self-esteem curriculum into the schools. Oopsie. We better put this on a shelf. So it was actually known. Yep. Ignored it. And then we have... um. The, you know, the lost hour around the world. Children get an hour less sleep than they did 30 years ago. The cost, IQ points, emotional being, ADHD, and obesity. You think maybe this would have been vital information for parents to know sometime before now? Well, and, and I, imagine, know, take, take, we... I imagine with the screen stuff doesn't help that even now. Thank you. But how many, how many more parents would have been motivated to say no screens after X time, no blue light, no this and that, because you're already not getting enough sleep and we're going to make sure how many would have fought back appropriately against, against extending the length of the school day, extending the amount of homework and it's busy work. It's not good, rigorous learning. It's just, uh, we didn't do anything in school because everybody was goofing off and I put you in a group project and nobody did anything. So go home and do the work you were supposed to do in the class. That's what most homework is. And these kids are not doing anything. Then why white parents don't talk about race. Now you might think, wait, Deba, believe it or not, the research around that is fascinating and actually probably explains why the overcorrection now, why so many white parents are like race, 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 race constantly. If you understood the research behind that, it would be like, oh, I get it. Why were all these like white liberal mommies are psychotic. Also, also look at uh, Shelby Steele's book, White Guilt for that one, because that's another, another yep. good book on that all, topic. All that happened was the, the same thing motivating people to not talk about race when like maybe they should have in a, in an appropriate way is now making them like over talk about it. And then we have, um, oops, then we have, uh, and it says, does teaching children about race and skin color make them better off or worse? And what the research found was it does not improve anything. Nope. So actually the white parents were originally right, but then we were told we were wrong and we were so bad for our colorblindness. Why kids lie and why you shouldn't get too freaked out about it. You know, that was another thing um, because a lot of the things we do to tell them to tell the truth, make them better liars. The search for intelligent life in kindergarten, the sibling effect, science of teen rebellion. This chapter is vital. If you have teenagers, you need this chapter. <laughs> and, can, and number eight, why might we have shelved the information on can self-control be taught? Because maybe SEL was already a big moneymaker. Yeah. Because SEL is 30 years old. Developers of a new kind of preschool keep losing their grant money. The students are so successful, they're no longer at risk enough to warrant further study. What's their secret? <laughs> so, you know, there's there's a lot in this book that is based on the idea that when you pick the wrong study to promote because it says what's politically expedient and you ignore the ones that say stuff that don't help anybody get elected, don't sell a lot of product for the schools, don't advance your particular agenda. Bad things happen when we, act, we ignore real scientific evidence and replace it with the science. <laughs> Yeah. And Science this is actually, you, you're actually reminding me of a great, um, so a while back I did the, did the article on pro-social motives, um, underlying scientific censorship, you know, scientists themselves being censored, but right. you actually remind me of something. So I'm going to see if I can't share this real quick. Um, if it cooperates, we shall see. Um, uh, yes, here we go. There we go. I think you have to put it up though. Okay, here we go. But this is a great figure to sort of visualize the problem with the science being the thing in that if you do have just the science being involved, right? So all these green dots are sort of a conceptualization of the science or the collection of fully peer reviewed literature and things like that, uh, which are allowed because let's, I mean, some, if you're talking about the science where you're getting into a groupthink issue, this is where it could end up being a problem, says something is true, but the red dots are, you know, this is wrong kind of thing. Well, then there's all the other evidence that's out there um, that might not have made it through peer review yet or might not have, you know, might even be shelved like it was for Nurture Shock, um, which says it's not true. 
So this is the kind of thing that can happen if you allow a scientific censorship kind of thing. And that's why I want to mention it, because don't let that be taught into kids either. I don't ever yeah. want to see that in the next generation of scientists, because I'm I'm at a point in my career where I'm starting to teach and train students myself. So I don't want to see students come <laughs> to me to be trained in science who are already thinking, you know, somebody who thinks differently from me is wrong and inherently evil. No, 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 no. They need to be questioning that and questioning those claims that have been taught to them all the time. I just wanted to bring that up because this is a really great graphic on that. And so if anybody's interested in that article, it's open access also. That comes from this um, lovely, lovely piece of work, actually, that was published uh, late last year. Right. So, so it's just, you know, <clears throat> be a very critical consumer of scientific research, even if you think as Adrian pointed out, well, I'm not a scientist and I don't know what, what. just ask mm -hmm. questions. A lot of it's common sense. I mean, I mm -hmm. read you the article and part of why I did is I'm not a scientist and I'm going through and going, well, wait a minute. Is this even true that we need a study? Yeah. Um, is this even a valid question? If you do research on this, how, how are you going to figure out if you've got an answer to your well, question? And, and importantly too, I know there's a temptation if you see a study that confirms what you think to just say, oh, it confirms what I think. I'm just going to take it and use it. Don't give in to that temptation to do that. Be just as critical yes. with it as you are with anything else. Because I have found it. some of those studies that I agree with that, yeah, they're shit. Um, well, <laughs> so, well, for example, the one about wise teens that says that yeah. the dialectic, uh, the DBT was iatrogenic for some of these teens. You have to remember that the DBT was done across a whole group of kids at the same time, whether they needed it or not. So the, a lot of people have come away with that going, see, DBT is BS. And it's like, no, actually, DBT is actually really, really helpful for people who genuinely need it in a very controlled environment where the, everybody has agreed to participate. It's not mandatory. And you know, it's it's done with the individuals in mind and their particular problem in mind and properly designed by a, by a responsible clinician it can be extremely helpful, especially people in, um, you know, certain kinds of family dynamic situations. So if you take that study and say, see, therapy is BS, especially for teenagers, you might miss something extremely helpful for your particular teenager because it was done in a school, which is not the right way to do it. So even with that, I had to look at it and go, see, SEL is not good in the school, but please don't extrapolate. Don't yep. take that to mean it's all bunk. Like SEL is bunk, but like that all the modalities of therapy that they're trying to do in a one size fits all scenario are are just BS. We may be an over therapized, you know, uh, uh, population, but please don't throw. I hate the expression, but the baby out with the bathwater. Some yeah. people genuinely need care, and that might be the modality that helps them. So just be careful. Yep. Yep. Or as so, I think I, I had a version of that euphemism that I had with the dark fiddling pirate when he was on side chat Saturday with me. Lee Jusum is his name, but he goes by the dark fiddling pirate on Twitter, which is just hysterical. Funny. But, um, you know, we had the euphemism. He's like, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, even if there's a little bit of shit floating in the bathwater. You clean <laughs> out the bathwater, not the baby. <laughs> e exactly. Exactly. So I'm um, just a couple of uh, I'm going to go through a couple of these comments here real quick. Thank you guys for coming and for joining in here. Um, and this is interesting. Esteban says the leftists don't even trust the science themselves. <laughs> I think we've seen that to be true. <laughs> and then he says, oh yeah, the Freudian speech that leftists don't pick up on. Yeah. There's a lot of slip ups that they put in there to like, you know, your intent doesn't matter except when it's our intent and it doesn't matter. Um, it's just when an abuser doesn't realize they cause the emotional trauma on a person or they don't want you to know. They don't want you to re you to realize it. Yep. And just an average man says schools are manipulating their students like Dems manipulate voters in Coties. I'm not sure. Uh, but oh, instead, in, I think it's in Coties, but I, I don't uh, know what it oh, means by that. Okay. Instead of cash handouts, they get free A's if they conform. Yeah. Get yourself a good grade. Say the thing we want. It, and kids are smart. I mean, you know, savvy in that way. They know what's expected of them. And then uh, Leave Them Kids Alone says, I think the schools do realize that they're damaging kids. They keep adding to it, making trauma literature even more heinous. They want more money to treat the damage they continue to cause. I do think that's part of it. I also think that some of them have been conditioned incorrectly or fed so-called evidence 
that that by exposing kids to certain information, they're making them more empathetic. Like if we show people about trauma, that they'll be more feeling and more empathetic to people who experience trauma. They don't, they don't even understand the own, their own trigger warnings. You know, they, they introduce trigger warnings and then they'll say trigger warning. It says this, it says that. And then they go here, read about a rape. <laughs> yeah. And they don't, and they don't know if there's a kid in the class, maybe who's been well, assaulted. And by the way, the literature is now out on that. That I mean, if you if you prime people with trigger warnings, they're actually more likely to be really anxious and things like that rather than one hundred percent, one hundred percent. So literature is there for that one now. We, I'm waiting for the study that comes out to finally prove that putting suicide hotline signs all over the place actually creates suicide clusters. Mm -hmm. And talking about school shootings constantly makes people anxious and likely leads to school, you know, and contributes to the, the Depression romance, and, yeah. you know, around school shootings. So the constantly talking about negative things does not make anything better. This is one thing I think that our grandparents at this point had over us. Yeah. It I, was we, socially we saw unacceptable. The, um, I'm sorry. We saw just an average man. I, I noticed you meant cities and not Cody's city. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, he said cities. So that was down yeah, here. Yeah, he meant cities, not Cody's. Got in it. Our in the comment earlier. Thank you. He also said physiology was corrupted when they allowed activists to publish uh, without scrutiny. Yes, psychology. I think you mean both. Both probably. <laughs> All I of it he, was. I think he probably means psychology because psychology's had a problem with yeah. that for a while. And actually, physiology this, too. If we don't know what a woman is, <laughs> this the good psychologist. There's like Lee is Lee is actually left of where I am, but he's he's on amongst a bunch of authors who realize they have a serious ideological bias yeah. problem in psychology. So they're trying to figure out how to fix it. There are yeah. actually some decent psychologists yeah. who are trying to fix that problem. Um, but, uh, and then he says, uh, take transgenderism. No transgender should ever write a scientific paper on the psychological condition they're suffering from. Well, I agree with that. I think whatever it is that you are going through, you're not the researcher that should be studying it. There's, it, It's impossible to pull out your personal experience or your bias or whatever. Well, um, I mean, you could write it. Don't get me wrong. You could write it and you could do the research with it. That's that's fine, I don't think, if you separated it. But that's the reason that peer review becomes so important. And that's why I get so sick of the lack of peer review in certain disciplines. And that's where it becomes a problem. So I don't, because you're talking about universalism. If it's universalism, I don't even look when I'm doing peer review at who a person is, where they're coming from, what have you. Usually I can pick out if a person has a bias just because I'm reading the article. I'm like, mm, this is biased in how you constructed the research. You need to go back and do it again. So it's, I don't like to say that somebody shouldn't write the article because they're transgender, but they should also be subject to the same rigorous scrutiny as everybody else in the article should not pass I, muster if it if it is, you know, they're writing from a biased perspective, you know? Well, I guess the point there is that right now, where we are right now, mm -hmm. I, I think people are afraid to put people under the the microscope, like to yeah. give them the same peer review, to get, put them under the same scrutiny. Mm -hmm. We're already not scrutinizing people if they fit certain intersectional demographics because of DEI. Yeah. So I think science has been corrupted and peer review has been corrupted because nobody wants to say, I'm going to scrutinize. Look at Claudine Gay was a plagiarist, the head of DEI at Harvard, plagiarist. It, somebody somewhere along the line wasn't very uh, diligent because reasons. Um, but well, to finish, well, in, indeed, indeed she wasn't, but I mean, I, I do have to make the point that it's just not all of a demographic group are going to think and write the same way about something. So it's kind of, I hesitate to say yeah. a person who is X shouldn't write oh, about it. That's not why I said it. I said it be more because right now our problems with peer review are such that I don't trust that the person will get the same scrutiny. That they'll no, be given is, like a more of a pass. This is why I were. advocate myself for what's called double blind peer review. Because right now what it is, is I as a reviewer, they would never know who I am. It's single blind peer reviewer, but the reviewers can see who the author is when it goes for peer review. In most right. cases, that's the way it is. Right. I've been advocating for a long time for double blind peer review because that way I don't know who the author is. I have no idea. I don't want to know their institution, their affiliation, what their name is, what their background is. I don't want to know that. It's the other reason I advocate against the positionality statements that are appearing in more and more articles and things like that. So, you know, don't want that. But that would help to mitigate a lot of those problems. If you have right. absolutely no idea who that person is, that right. would make people feel a lot safer to say, well, I can criticize it, this person. Yeah, that's all I said is like right now, if we have people who are going through the thing that they're researching, the the ethos is be nice to them. 
Yeah. And, and that includes how we review their work, but to finish up what we were talking about, like our ancestors, our grandparents, it was socially unacceptable to air your dirty laundry yep. to your childhood trauma. And people say, well, that was repression and they didn't get to talk about it and then go to therapy or whatever. Okay. Perhaps to too great a degree, that's true. But I think we went way, way overboard correcting that to the point now where it's performative that, you know, trauma, 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 it's almost a competition, how much trauma you have. You've got 10 year olds walking around using psychological terms like narcissist, borderline. I have this, I have that. My mom is this, my dad is that they're diagnosing their friends. They're going online and making proclamations about people and at playing armchair psychologist and doctor and whatever. And I don't think they're happier for it. In fact, I don't think most of us who've had lots and lots of therapy are necessarily happier because of the therapy. Mm -hmm. that, that, that unless and until you get into a situation where you find ways to cope, and yeah. I know we don't like that word and you say cope and it seems like a slur, but for our grandparents, that was important. I and mean, what's interesting is looking at the, looking at the, um, the research we did today, they're saying, no, it doesn't stress people out. It's funny when educators and education researchers are very, very comfortable saying who should and shouldn't have to cope. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, cope with it. Don't be so fragile, but toughen up, struggle, live in the sit and sit with your discomfort, be mm -hmm. uncomfortable. But then they'll turn around in the next breath and go trauma informed, trauma informed, trauma informed. It's very confusing. Imagine being a kid today. Yeah. Everything in the world is trigger warnings and trauma informed, except when I want you to sit with your struggle and sit well, with your pain. It's also trigger warnings and trauma informed, despite the fact that things today are vastly different from from my grandparents. Imagine me saying I'm like trauma informed or triggered just because I have to deal with a lot of, you know, deal with a lot of stuff with the university job and things like that. I would be so, I could never do it because I would be so belittling of all the things that my grandparents went through. It's like, I've talked about it before. It's like my grandparents, my mother's on my mother's side came from Europe, came from Estonia specifically. They had to escape the Nazis. They had to escape the Soviets. Lots of crazy, horrific things they had to do to, they had to deal with, not do themselves, but deal with to, to get to the United States, to actually be able to live here. And thank goodness they did. They put up with a lot more evil stuff. Like my grandmother's first husband was murdered by the Soviets for crying out loud. So it's just like, right. I can't complain about a whole heck of a lot going on in my life. Cause I'm like, I have a heck of a lot better than my grandparents. <laughs> right. And I mean, you know, it's people say, well, it's relative. Okay. Yeah. But we don't indulge things to the point of making a bigger deal out of something for someone. Yeah. And I think that's what we're doing for our kids is there's a lot of projection going on. And when you talk about the stamp thing and racial injustice, when they go into a school with a so-called intervention and they're telling us like, no, don't worry. It doesn't stress them out. That's why my first thing is like, I, whether it's going to stress them out or not is secondary to whether that stress would be beneficial to them. Is it yeah. going to make them stronger? Yeah. Is it going to teach them something truly useful that will better their lives and better the lives of the people in the classroom with them? Is it going to enhance their learning ability for other subjects and skills? Then a little bit of discomfort. I, even I, as a parent, I'm like, that's fine. I yeah. don't expect them to enjoy every moment of literature class or whatever. But at the same time, if you can't demonstrate that this is necessary, and it stresses them out. Yep. That's the problem. So I think, you know, we, we've got to get our whole, like what's stressful, not stressful prioritized. Yeah. And, and that's good stress versus stuff. bad stress. Exactly. Exactly. So, so anyway, I think you have a few more. Yes. Commentaries. Okay. So then we have, um, leave them kids alone says kids did not care what color anyone was until they changed celebrating cultures with food and dances at assemblies to constant affinity groups. Young ones constantly hear equity, equity. You're so right. I feel like I've been transported backwards in time yeah. to some previous decade that I never lived in. Yeah. I never ever. lived in that decade either. And I mean, I call, I call it regressive for a reason. Cause that's exactly what it is. Critical it, consciousness is regressive, not progressive. 100%. Um, they actually call them subject matter experts because they have the conditions. Mm. Oh, you mean when they have the conditions they're researching, they call them subject matter experts purely because they suffer from the condition. I'd have to say I haven't seen that defined, at least not in the peer-reviewed literature. It could be somewhere else, but I haven't seen that. So I'll, I'll have to take a look a little bit more into it. I've seen it in schools, yeah, but I haven't schools, seen it in sure. the research. Yeah. Um, 
Esteban says, yeah, there are trans people that don't agree. With, and I know some of them personally. And that that is absolutely true. And one of the reasons that I get so fired up about what they call research in this area that gets pushed into schools is that it is so one sided and it actually isn't research. Mm -hmm. And it's hurting. It, it's hurt. The people who are most harmed by all of this are trans people and le uh, lesbians, gays, bisexual people. Because they've been sucked into an agenda and an, and a uh, a movement that is political and has nothing really actually to do with identity. It's really mm -hmm. much more about politics. And so you have people who are just living their lives, minding their business, and suddenly it's like, okay, here's the inventory of beliefs you have to have because you're gay. And you're like, nah, -uh. I bet. Wait, what? I don't know. I don't yep. believe that. And yep. you don't. And now you're a heretic. That's the other reason it's so regressive is that it's demanding that you are X, so you should believe this. Exactly. No, it doesn't have to have anything to do with that. So. Exactly. Exactly. And then, uh, yeah, he says his hypocrisy is their MO. And then um, Leave Them Kids Alone says, Ad just Ad popped in saying, sit, stay, and, tr sit, stay, and trust fall. That's I, weird. <laughs> I, I've always wondered what the ads are that come into my show. Uh, I've heard some of them are pretty bad, like, you know, SEL or whatever. And I'm like, hey, y'all want to pay me to like, you know, tell you how crappy your crap is. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so it's, I don't make much of you guys, but there it is. Um, all right. Well, Adrian, this has been a slice. I love, I love talking with you. It's very educational or educational. <laughs> I know. I'm still working on it, but I'm hoping soon to to actually be able to put some courses together on how do you read articles and how do you dig up uh, funding information and all that kind of jazz. Yeah, um, we, need folks, so. we need that. We need that. At the moment, though, it's just, you know, you could publish just like a, an explainer of like, do this, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just have some do's and don'ts and some basic stuff and like what means what. Because I know for people like me, it's like, okay. I get what abstract means, but what you Paul talked about limitations, like why is that important? And, you know, study design, what to look for, like red flags to look for, things like that would be important because these days we are told constantly that something is evidence-based or a study said. Not mm -hmm. a day goes by, especially parents. Parents are overwhelmed. I mean, I don't, the scientific American is not wrong. Yeah. No, 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 they're, they're not wrong. There are sometimes when Scientific American actually gets the broader point right. It's just that they're, they're also, I'll give you an example of the stupidity of Scientific American lately, but um, they're also the ones who publish things like, well, we shouldn't use the acronym JEDI to talk about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion because the JEDI in Star Wars are really problematic and how they treated different people and different races. So we shouldn't... It, that kind of stupidity okay yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there are things there are things like that but um but yeah a tip i can give you guys actually for for getting a hold of some of these studies because more and more you're getting open access like the one we just read today is open access so you can just go grab it right right um but if it's not if you have a local university nearby just go pop onto the campus with your phone or with a laptop or something like that, because most universities have institutional subscriptions to a lot of these journals, which means if you go through the university Wi-Fi, you can get the article yourself for free. If cool. you're just sitting there on the university campus or going through their library system or something like that, or if like, if you are an like, alumna of a particular university, go go through that university thing because you might still have an account and you could log into the library website and just right. like, okay, I want this article. See if they have access to it. You can download it for yourself for free. Well, and another thing is if your school is claiming that some intervention or something that they're doing in the class with your child is evidence-based or based on some kind of research paper, mm -hmm. um, you have every right to ask to see the paper. Yeah. And they'll say, you know, FOIA it or whatever. I don't think that you have to FOIA something if they're if you're asking what they're doing in the class right then and they say it's based on research. I think you can just ask and say, can I please just see a copy of the research? If they make you FOIA, FOIA it. But that, you know, you have a right to know what yeah. they're basing this stuff on. Mm -hmm. And they can't just wing it and say evidence based and I don't know what evidence. Yeah. Because that's their entire argument. So yeah. But 
but that, yeah, that's another good point there, Deb, because the, the journals are out there and they're published and they have their own subscription fees and things like that. I mean, if you really want to, I think most of them runs like $30, $30 an article to download it if you're not a subscriber, which isn't right. terrible, but it isn't great either. So, you know, it's that kind of a thing. But um, you can still get a hold of these articles, but because right. those are published and out there by other authors schools don't have a right to hide that behind FOIAs unless they are talking specifically about, you know, how did they implement the results from that particular study? That might right. be something you'd That's have to That's the part. For. No, you're absolutely correct. You may have to FOIA like what the lesson plan was and how they did it and stuff like that. But if it's, if they're saying we're using CASEL or we're using second step SEL, blah, 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 you have to FOIA to look at the SEL program that they used, like the actual lesson plans. But if they say, because it's based on research, you can ask to see the research and I don't, you don't have to FOIA no. that. Yeah. No, that's not, that's not that, proprietary. No, that's well, how do I put it? It's proprietary in the sense that it's published by a journal and it's copyright, it's subscription fees for the journal, that, but it yes. is not proprietary to the school or to Correct. Castle or to any of those institutions. So they have no right to hide it. Right. Now that's where it gets tricky. Because Castle does its own research. This to, is going to be the thing. Yes. If it's their they, own they, research. They're a self-licking the ice cream cone. So one of the problems I have with SEL. That is, is an that, interesting euphemism, a self-licking ice cream cone. But anyway. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, I would say 90% of the research done on SEL is self is, is self-serving. So, um, and, and ego brain says probably a good idea to never let them use your child for this stuff. I would agree. I mean, you, if you're, they're asking your child to participate in research, then as Adrian pointed out, you have every right to ask about every last little thing about the study. Mm -hmm. and, and not just, and not just of the authors, because if it's a research thing like this, it had to go through IRB and the IRB must respond to anybody who has a question about it. Correct. It's correct. a legal requirement. They have to. <laughs> Estevan cracks me up. They don't realize <laughs> that Star Wars is an allegory about totalitarianism. No, they surely do not. Mm -hmm. They don't get it. So yeah, All right. I suppose to conclude on this particular study today, well, yeah, it does stress kids out, just uh, the specific groups of kids. And to think it's not from the intervention is pretty silly might be my bottom line conclusion after reading that study. Right. <laughs> don't buy it. Next time you run into someone that goes, they doesn't try to get down, just be like, but it does. And that's not really the point because mm -hmm. it's critical consciousness. It's critical theory in the classroom. It doesn't belong there. Yep. Right. All right. Adrian, you're the best. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, next time we have something. <laughs> that's going to happen sometime. <laughs> it's going to happen. Well, we, I found a treasure trove of stuff today about, uh, a, that AI, but like VR and, uh, I, yeah, you were sharing that earlier and I'm like, Oh my God, my head hurts. Yeah, there's some really scary stuff out there. I don't know if Adrian has a stomach for it, but we'll see. And if we find something, we'll we'll be back. All right, you guys have a great rest of your Saturday. Bye, guys. <laughs>